towards the chambers. Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. My name is Matlodi Maseko, and I am the Standing Committee Chair for Infrastructure that it used to be called Human Settlements. And I want to start by welcoming each and every one of you. But there's a precedence that has been set that um, we've got member Sileku who leads us with a prayer all the time. So if we can start with the prayer and then we'll continue with the program of tonight. Over to you, sir. Thank you very much, Chair. Good afternoon. Can you just close our eyes, please? Baba, we to a command of Jesus Christ to us in Nazareth. Ngwe izolongwe namhlanje ngwe na pagade na namhlanje sizaku wosikwali zbongo siabulela utewa ngutiko kwe zimvula wasifisha wisanza saku esnubobele na namhlanje ngulungulu bako na bavu gile bakhona bangavukanga ngalapho bekuthande wena sisaqhuba njalo uNkulunkulu nezinhlangano zethu sicela wena ube ngothixo obonelelayo onginelelayo ukuthi umuntu ngamnye othe wakhona namhlanje ube ngothixo ozomthatha umbhekise apho asoka khona uzo zibaye dangbar for the lion date what if once unbeat om el kadakhna i truen fan khanade de kom netom to say baye danki that i khot Van ons is, van alles wat ons vra, zal ons altijd krijgen. Ons sê baie dankie vir die reen, en ons dink ook aan die families wat geraak was as gevolg van die reen, en ons vra dat u ook hulle sal bewaar, en dat u ook een voorziening kan wees in hulle. Ons sê baie dankie dat u altijd met ons gewees het, van die eerste dag toe ons met die publieke deelname begin het, en dat ons vandag onze laatste publieke deelname vergadering sal het en ons sê baie dankie dat u vertroubaar was aan ons dat ons deur die paie beskerm het in elke dorp in elke vergadering en ons sê baie dankie aan elke lid van die komitee aan die manier hoe ons mekaar hanteer en hoe ons met mekaar werk en dit kan net u wees dit kan net u genade wees father is about to conclude our last meeting we say we give thanks to you we say thank you for being a father that has always been there for us. You protected us. You've guided us. As we conclude our last public participation today, we can only give you the honor, the glory, and admiration. In Jesus' name we pray and thank you. Amen and amen. Amen. Thank you very much, member. I am going to continue with the program and ask the members to introduce themselves. Over to you, members. Thank you, Chair. My name is Kayla Murray, and I'm a member of this committee. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Mbulela Isaac Sileku, member of the committee. Thanks, Chair, and good afternoon to everyone. Pat Maran, member of this committee. Uh, I'm Peter de Villiers, a member of this committee. Thank you very much. You will be joined by member Tlas. I know he is still um, held up in another meeting. He will introduce himself after he joins us. I am also going to allow our colleagues from National Department of Public Works and Infrastructure to introduce themselves. Thank you, Chairperson. My name is Rivuan Indo from National Department of Public Works. Uh, I'm with my colleague of mine, Johannes Dikal, from National Department of Public Works as well. Thank you. Thank you very much. And from the Department of Infrastructure in Western Cape. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Pamela Masiko Kambala. I'm the Director for Infrastructure Policy and Research in the Department. Good evening, everyone. My name is Olga Koma. I'm the ASD in the same department. Thank you. Paul um, Quillen from um, the same unit. Thanks. 
Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Jackie Gooch. I'm the head of department for the Western Cape Department of Infrastructure. Thank you very much. Just to note this meeting today, we are in a hybrid form also online. We do have um, the community members, I can see that have joined us. And the, so the, the proceedings, it will be for the submission. When we get to the submissions, it will be online. We are going to allow the community members that are online to do that. And also we do have, I only see Nicholas Diaz online that has joined us and also the oral from the floor in-house. Now, we do have two legislations that we are going to deal with today. The first one, it will be the expropriation bill. And the second one, it will be the housing protection consumer bill. We are going to start with the housing, with the expropriation bill. The first on the program, it will be, we get the presentation from the national um, department about this bill. After that, I'm going to open up for the questions from the floor in clarity of the presentation. So, Always we, I get a problem because it's like um, the understanding is not there. I'm hoping today it will be different. So the questions will be about the presentation. Then when we are done with the questions, is then that I open up for the submissions. So please make my life easier that it might be when submission is done, you hear something that you don't like. It's not responsibility of anyone in the house to respond to that submission because each and every one's opinion is allowed in here and we appreciate your different ways of thinking. That is why we are all here. So don't take it upon yourself to respond. Try to hold your horses even if you want to respond so bad. Don't respond to that because... It sort of causes a little bit of disability in the meetings that goes well. So help me on dealing with that in that fashion. So I'm not going to waste any time. I'm going to allow the, who's going to do the presentation, Ms. Dendo? I'm going to hand over to you, sir. Chairperson, the colleague of mine is going to actually take through the presentation and uh, over to him without okay. any waste of time. Um, thank you very much. Mr. Luka, over to you. So, allocation, oh, over to you, sir. Sorry. You. It's an open meeting. Yeah, it's an open meeting, so you can you can do that as long as it doesn't disrupt the running of the meeting. That is fine. Just make sure that it doesn't disturb any 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 program of of today, the decently. So you can do that. Say it's not a problem. Thank you very much, and community members. Um, Thank you, thank you, thank you. I forgot to welcome you also, and thank you for being with us. Even though the weather is a little bit cold, but we know when it's winter, usually it's cold. So we are okay in that way. Mr. Lika, over to you. Thank you, Chairperson. Members of the committee, members of the public who have come here to engage with the committee on the expropriation bill. The presentation that I will make will not cover everything that is in the bill itself. We will mainly deal with those key aspects that uh, are very important. The starting point... Mr. Likal, I'm sorry to interject just to... because it's going to be difficult for others to follow on on the papers. 
let me ask you, Miss, to put the slides there so that the page by page, each and everyone can follow from the presentation. Is it okay? You are using the same presentation that we do have. Okay. So let's help you in that question so that um, there we go. Okay, the, the first thing that uh, we will do is just to understand the basis for, for the development of this bill and thereafter deal with the overview in respect of the specific uh, provisions of, uh, of the bill itself. Uh, the first point to make as a as a point of departure is that uh, the constitution is the supreme law of the country. Law or conduct inconsistent with it is invalid. What this means is that uh, the expropriation bill itself, because it is What this means is that the expropriation bill itself, because it is a law that is developed in Parliament, it has to mirror the provisions of the Constitution. Because if, as you can uh, clearly see in the first bullet, the, the Constitution says it is the supreme law of the country, law or conduct. Uh, inconsistent with it is invalid. Therefore, the expropriation bill is law and it has to be consistent with the provisions of the Constitution. Specifically, it has to mirror the provisions of the property clause of the Constitution. Now, lawful expropriation can only occur when it is for a public purpose or in the public interest and subject to the payment of just and equitable compensation. Now, we have uh, chosen to specifically zoom on the aspect of public interest because in the previous uh, legislation, the Expropriation Act 63 of 1975, public interest is not dealt with. Uh, the, the Act only deals with public purpose. So the Constitution, in the context of the Constitution, includes the nation's commitment to land reform and to reforms to bring about equitable access to all of South Africa's natural resources. So this is the definition that appears also as part of uh, the definition provisions of the Constitution. Now, in terms of the overview, of the bill itself. Sorry, I forgot. Is there anyone who wants the translation of Africans? Or is it closer? We are all okay with English. Okay, it seems like that. You can continue. Okay. As I've already indicated, the bill should mirror, or is, uh, for it to be valid, it has to mirror the provisions of uh, 
the property clause of the Constitution. And therefore, what this means is that uh, it is also facilitating the implementation of Section 25 of the Constitution. In other words, it is through the bill itself that we are implementing section the the section uh, uh, 25 provisions of the constitution that deals specifically with expropriation now one of the important aspects to note that comes from the constitution itself or which is a requirement of the constitution is that section 33 of the constitution must be given effect to and this provision requires the bill to incorporate the principle of just administrative action. This improvement in the bill seeks to mitigate the drastic nature of expropriation. We are seeing expropriation is a drastic measure uh, because it is only the state that can use this power. Private persons cannot use the power to expropriate. So when the state uses this power and when it serves the, the notice of expropriation, there are no further negotiations that can be entered into. And that is the drastic nature that uh, we are referring to. Now, the requirement that uh, just administrative action must be observed is to mitigate or to lessen the drastic nature of um, the, the expropriation itself. Now, in terms of the requirements of uh, just administrative action, the first thing to no take note of is the fact that uh, there has to be notification that must be done in, by publication of the of an intended expropriation the notification itself must be given to all affected person about the intended expropriation and it must indicate the purpose and the rationale for such expropriation interested parties must be afforded an opportunity to raise object, objections and make representations to the expropriating authority before a decision to expropriate is taken. The expropriating authority must consider all submissions uh, by, made by interested parties before deciding whether or not to proceed with an, uh, an expropriation. Because if the expropriating authority considers some submissions, the decision to expropriate based on just a few submissions would not be in accordance with uh, the principles of just administrative action. Now, another point to take into account is the fact that expropriate, expropriation authority or the power to expropriate is not only exercised by the Minister of Public Works and Infrastructure who is responsible for the management of the current act which is the 1975 Expropriation Act and this bill which will be, uh, replace the 1975 Act when it is passed into law. It is not only the Minister of Public Works and Infrastructure who exercises this authority. There are expropriating authority authorities across the three spheres of government and other organs of state within these spheres, uh, uh, this spheres of government that are empowered through legislation to expropriate for matters connected with their functional areas of legislative competence. What this means is that, for instance, the Minister of Health can expropriate for purposes of health if 
the Minister of Health requires to build a health facility and there is no land to build that facility. Legislation allows the Minister of Health to expropriate for purposes connected with his or her functional area of legislative competence. And it goes on, for instance, the Minister of, uh, of Education can do the same. And in respect of uh, organs of state, the, the well-known one is ESCOM. ESCOM can also expropriate. SANRAL can also expropriate to build a road and so forth. Now, the, the most important thing that this bill seeks to achieve is to ensure that uh, there is consistency with the Constitution and also the fact that uh, there is uniformity of procedure for all expropriating authority without interfering with the existing power, their existing power of expropriation. So there are a lot of uh, expropriating authorities out there. Now, when this bill is passed into law, it is not going to take away their power to expropriate, but what it will seek to achieve is to ensure that uh, there is uniformity in respect of procedure and there is consistency in respect of uh, the implementation of the, uh, the provisions of the Constitution. We will now deal with uh, the specific clauses of the bill itself. Clauses one and two deals with the uh, definitions and the application of the of the bill. And as I've already indicated, lawful expropriation can take place only if it is for a public purpose or it is in the public interest. And when this happens, um, and when the expropriating authorities expropriate throughout the three spheres of government, that it in, in itself ensures that uh, the principle of cooperative government and inter-government uh, relations is promoted. Uh, for instance, uh, one of the requirements is that one expropriating authority may require the consent of another expropriating authority or organ of state before an expropriation can take place. Um, the, 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 the expropriating authorities are required by legislation to cooperate. And another example in respect of uh, the principle of the promotion of the principle of cooperative government that we can uh, refer to in the bill would be in, the, in respect of uh, the requirement to keep an, expropriate, an expropriation register. The, the register, obviously, because all expropriating authority would have access to it, that in itself would ensure that they cooperate and share information around expropriation. One of the requirements um, of um, clauses one and two is that uh, there has to be negotiations before an expropriation can take place. Otherwise, if there is no evidence of such an attempt to, um, to negotiate before the acquisition of uh, a property earmarked for expropriation, the likelihood is that uh, such a decision could be struck down for non-compliance with the, with the with the act itself. Clauses three and four deals with the, the powers of the Minister of Public Works and Infrastructure to expropriate, as well as uh, the, the delegation of authority. Um, they are very specific powers that are given to the Minister, and they have to do with the uh, the provision and management of accommodation, land and infrastructure needs of organs of state 
uh, within the the area of a mandate. Um, that is in the national sphere, the Minister of uh, Public Works and Infrastructure is empowered to expropriate for purposes connected with, uh, you know, the provision of accommodation for national uh, departments uh, or for ensuring that uh, there is infrastructure requirements also for national government departments. In the uh, provincial sphere, uh, the the counterpart of the Minister of Public Works and Infrastructure in the province has got the same authority in terms of the relevant piece of legislation. Clauses 5 and 6 deals with the uh, investigation and valuation of the property. Uh, it is important that uh, before any property can be expropriated, it has to be investigated whether it is feasible to do that. So it, it sets forth the procedure that must be observed by an expropriating authority before an expropriation uh, can take place. And the procedure includes investigation, issues around uh, access to the property, and the nature of the information that must be uh, acquired to ensure that uh, the expropriation becomes uh, a reality. And also the issue of uh, compensation. In the collection of information, the information should also be able to indicate the nature or the amount of compensation that must be payable um, at that stage. And then uh, it also provides for consultation with other uh, authorities who may have an interest in in an expropriation uh, in an expropriation matter. I, in this regard, we are referring to perhaps other departments of government. Uh, primarily, you'd find that uh, you'd have the Department of uh, Rural Development, Agriculture, Rural Development, and Land Reform, um, Department of uh, Minerals, and uh, departments of uh, environment and municipalities also in terms of uh, municipal planning and so forth. Clauses 7 to 11 deals with uh, the notice of uh, intention to, expropriation, uh, to expropriate and uh, notice of expropriation. And it provides for the nature, timeframes and publication and service of uh, a notice of intention to expropriate, or what is sometimes referred to as a pre-expropriation notice. And this notice makes it possible for the affected party to make objections, to make representations, or to make compensation claims, or other submissions uh, necessary uh, during uh, this stage of uh, the intended uh, expropriation. So it also indicates the the time frames, the type of uh, publications, and so forth. After the notice of uh, intention to expropriate, there is another notice that uh, must also be served on the affected parties which is uh, the notice to expropriate. So there are two distinct notices. There is a notice of intention to expropriate, which has got its own requirements, and there is a notice to expropriate. Now, in terms of uh, the notice to expropriate, what is required is that uh, it must be accompanied by details of uh, the proposed date of uh, expropriation, uh, the date of payment of, of compensation, how the offer of compensation is constituted, uh, the survey diagrams or sketch maps of uh, the property, the nature of the rights on, in the property, and so forth. So once 
this notice is served on the affected parties. The implication is that the ownership moves from the owner to the expropriating authority at that stage. In other words, there is no need for the expropriating authority to produce evidence of registration of the property, maybe in the deeds office and so on. Once the notice of expropriation is served on the affected party, the expropriating authority becomes the owner immediately. Clauses 12 to 18 deals with the uh, issues of compensation. And uh, what needs to be noted uh, specifically in this regard is that uh, clause 12 of the bill is a reflection of uh, section 25.3 of the constitution, uh, which is the general standard for for compensation. And uh, amongst others, the requirement that is set by the Constitution, which is reflected in the bill, is that uh, just and equitable compensation must be paid, and the requirements that must be looked into or that must be assessed, amongst others, include the current use of the property, the history of the, of the acquisition and use of the property, the market value of the property, the extent of direct state investment and subsidy in the acquisition of, uh, uh, of the property and beneficial capital improvement of the property, and the purpose of the expropriation. These are not the only factors that uh, uh, will be considered because uh, one of the the, the, the requirements of uh, the constitution is that uh, all other relevant factors must be assessed. It is not only this, uh, it is not only these factors that uh, must be uh, weighed by the expropriating authority before a decision to expropriate is taken. There is also clause 12.3, which uh, I, I want to refer specifically to. And uh, clause 12.3 is usually referred to as uh, the nil compensation provision. Um, it also provides that uh, it may be just and equitable in certain situations to expropriate and pay nil compensation. And it also, it is structured in the same way as uh, the provision that I referred to in terms of being brought by saying state in certain instances, but not limiting to only those instances, but uh, taking into account all other relevant factors uh, where it may be necessary not to pay uh, compensation. But uh, what we must bear in mind is that uh, the payment of nil compensation uh, has to be just and equitable and that there has to be a balancing of rights process that must comply with Section uh, 36 of the Constitution. Section 36 of the Constitution uh, deals with the, the limitation of rights. So the, when, when property is expropriated, uh, obviously it is a, it is a, limita a limitation in respect of uh, the right to own property. And once your right to own property is limited, it has to uh, the authority that uh, limits your right to property has to comply with Section 36 of the of the Constitution. 
I have already mentioned uh, the circumstances uh, for nil compensation in terms of uh, clause 12.3. They are listed there, uh, A to E, but they are not the only the only factors uh, that may be taken um, into account because it says relevant factors, all relevant factors or all relevant circumstances that may justify the payment of nil compensation. Uh, some of them we may not necessarily know uh, at this point. Clause 13 makes provision for the payment of uh, interest on any outstanding amount of compensation once the right to take possession of the property has passed to an expropriating authority. So there may be situations where there is uh, there may be a delay to pay comp uh, to pay compensation to to the expropriated owner or other rights holders, and when that happens. Uh, such persons may have uh, the right to claim uh, the payment of uh, interest on the compensation due. The, the other provisions, uh, as I've indicated, also I, I'm not going to go into the specifics of uh, clauses 14 to 15, 16, but they also deal with uh, issues of uh, compensation. And uh, clause, clause 17 is very important in respect of uh, the issue of ensuring that the municipalities are paid outstanding property rates and other charges. So there is a, there will be money set aside for such a purpose in whenever expropriation takes place. And clause 18 makes provision for the payment of uh, or for the de depositing of compensation money with the master of the high court in certain situations. For instance, where the, there is still a dispute in respect of uh, compensation and the compensation amount has already, already been determined that money can be handed over to the master of the high court uh, for safekeeping or sometimes uh, beneficiaries cannot be traced uh, or there are disputes between beneficiaries and so on and uh, in those instances the the money will be deposited with the master of the high court Clause 19 provides for the settlement of compensation dispute by mediation or through the, the competent uh, court. And uh, practically, this gives effect to Section 34, which deals with uh, access uh, to court, Section 34 of the Constitution. However, it should be noted that the existence of a dispute in respect of compensation uh, do not necessarily suspend the decision by an expropriating authority to expropriate the affected property. And the vesting of ownership and possession in, 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 in the property uh, will still be valid. The next important part in the bill deals with agent expropriations. And agent expropriations are covered in clause 20 of the bill. And uh, the agent expropriation is an, a temporary measure. And it, 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 it takes place under specific circumstances. And those circumstances are circumstances that are covered by the Disaster Management Act of 2002 or in situations where the court orders that uh, an agent expropriation has to take place. And because it is a temporary measure, 
it is only permissible to take place for a period of 12 months. And when an agent expropriation takes place, just an equitable compensation must be paid to an affected party. The period of temporary use may not be exceed the maximum period of 18 months from the date of an agent expropriation. So there may be a situation where by consent uh, of the affected parties, the period of uh, temporary exp uh, uh, expropriation is extended, or the court also can order that uh, and a, a temporary expropriation be extended. Clause 21 deals with the uh, withdrawal of expropriation. And a withdrawal of an expropriation can take place only when it is in the public interest or the reason for which the property was expropriated is no longer applicable. The bill does not permit the withdrawal of an expropriation under certain specified circumstances. For instance, after the expiry of three months from uh, the time of uh, an expropriation or where ownership has passed uh, through registration in the deeds office or where compensation has already been paid. Unless in these situations, uh, the consent of the, of the affected parties can be obtained. The remaining provisions are really general uh, standard uh, provisions for instance, clause 22 deals with the service of documents and so forth. But uh, the most important one that I want to refer to uh, is the requirement that uh, there has to be an, a, a, a register of expropriations that is maintained, established and maintained by the Ministry of uh, Public Works and Infrastructure. And uh, this uh, register will deal with uh, issues around all notices that have got to do with intended uh, expropriations, uh, decisions to expropriate, and uh, withdrawals of uh, an expropriation. Um, the other provisions, have, uh, as I've already indicated, are just standard uh, uh, legislative projects. Uh, 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 provisions. Uh, Chairperson, I will I will pause here because I've covered uh, the key provisions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Lukala. And that is the presentation and the story about this bill. So I just want to indicate this about the process. We this bill was ATC in Western Cape the 13th of April, and after that, the committee went on the public hearings, um, five public hearings for the bill itself. It was advertised throughout the month of May, and after that, the now the public hearings, which is the last one here. Um, we are going to consider the inputs of the community. And after this, we are going to have a negotiating mandate with the submissions that we are going to receive. So the most important thing when you are here is to make sure that the paper that you have written your submission, please, please, it helps us to have that. The recording is there, we'll do the recording, but if you also have a piece of paper, just drop it on, on our table so that we can have that as we compile our matrices. 
So our matrix, it will be all the submissions that we got from Western Cape about that has to do with this bill. Please remember that. I'm going to open up for the questions. Say your name and say name before you ask the question. And I'm going to give each and every one about two questions. Don't ask more than two questions. I think we need more time for the submissions than the questions itself. But I'm not holding you off for uh, interrogating this bill, asking the questions to the department. Members, I know I've been um, holding you back in asking the questions also throughout the, the, the public hearing. So today, because it's the last day, is that that I can open up that you also can ask the questions because I've been refusing to hear from them uh, throughout the public hearing. So today, because it's the last day, they can ask the questions. But I'm going to caution that let the public be the ones that ask more questions than all of you because I know I, I can give the blank check, which your questions it will be a minute. If you do have questions, please don't ask them if you don't have. I already know your voices. So with that being said, <laughs> I'm opening up for the questions. So if you can just raise your hand and then you can only talk if I've identified you after you raise the hand, press the mic in front of you. You can do that in any language that you are comfortable with to ask those questions. The questions is about that presentation. Ma'am, I've seen you. You are the first one. Hi, good day. I'm Valdila Damons from Reitewag. Um, the right to own property. Does Reitewag housing fall under the same category? Um, those houses are 80 plus minus 90 years old. And I'm also um, facing eviction. So I really, after my husband passed away, I can't anymore. I have fallen behind because of COVID. There's one income and um, transport. It's made it difficult because I normally use the train and now I have to Uber. And um, all those into consideration, Communique has demanded demanded the money from me. I don't know where to go from here. I cannot lose my roof. I cannot lose that house. Thank you so much. It's Thank not just from me. Thank you very much, ma'am. I know the department is here, they are, they are listening. I'm going to direct to them. But one of them will take the, the information, ma'am. Look, look at me, I'm directing you to the right, right uh, people that can help us. Um, there's the HOD there, you see that lady that with the pink jacket? If you can, because she doesn't know the background to the story of what's happening. So if you can give her your name, your information, and explain a thing and your contact number, we'll try to find out what happened and then we'll communicate with you. That's the person that you can talk Thank to. Thank you so much. Okay. Ma'am, over to you. Thank you. Uh, yes, I, I am Mrs. Njoli. I'm born in District 6 and I'm renting a house from Communicare, from Google to Communicare. And I found that now recently that the house I'm renting uh, is from City of Cape Town, was from municipality. Actually, it from, was from the British, and it was uh, the title deed of the house is from nine. Is from nineteen. Nineteen. The law was established nineteen forty four for that. The house is nineteen forty eight. The title deed of the house is was drawn nineteen forty eight. But from that time, it's never, no one have received the title deed, and I'm still renting it. 
all in all, I've been renting in Western Cape for 40 years, and I never got a title deed. I deserve and honored to get that house in Redawa. Thank you very much, Vim. Let me do it this way. Those that are coming with the issues of communicate, just raise your hand for me. Okay. So we are going to talk about the issues of communicate today. So bear with me because we are busy with the bill, but your concerns your for you to come here, um, I, I note that. And I think I do have the HOD here that can help me to get the name. So I'm going to ask our support staff, can you do me a favor, be able to deal with the bill, but not shortchanging the, the challenges that the community members do have? Say, over to you. Yeah, question um, in terms of the bill. Um, does the president and the premier um, have executive decisions um, to expropriate? That's one question. The other question is the existing constitution. Um, does it um, make provision for expropriation? My name is Neville Peterson. I'm from the um, Community Tenant Beneficiaries. Thank you very much. Over to you, sir. Gwandiles Kosana. I'm from Build One, South Africa. So my question is, with urgent expropriation, is there a process where if the Premier has authorities to be able to expropriate properties of owners that haven't been in South Africa or haven't been using property for the benefit of those that are homeless, those that are being evicted, because currently we have an issue where we don't have resources in communities where people can go to where they don't have uh, any places to go to. So is there a process where urgent expropriation can be given to the premier to execute, to accommodate the people that don't have property and the access? Because the constitution is supreme. The constitution also recognizes dignity as one of the pillars. So in executing that particular right, is there a, pro a process where the community can be informed in a language of instruction, in a language that they understand? Because also this particular conversation creates inaccessibility when it's used in a language that people don't understand. So if we make access PAJA, Promotion of Administrative Justice Act, talks about empire, talks about giving people access to information, but in information is inaccessible if it's not in a language that you can understand. So. Firstly, is there a process of giving people information in their language that they can understand? Secondly, is there authorities to the premier to provide access to expropriation processes so that they can offer people that don't have housing property? Yes. Thank you very much, ma'am. Can you switch off the mic here? Then I see you. How many questions? How many questions now that you have? And then you take five. Okay, over to you. Um, my name is Amy Barkley, and uh, my question relates to Clause 5, 12.5 of the expropriation bill that reads, if the property is land, the expropriating authority must consider the amount of outstanding municipal property rates and taxes. So my question to you, so is everyone here sitting today has raised the question about land, right? Everyone's made reference to a house, a piece of land, a piece of property. That's how we understand this act, to be referring to land. But the way five is written, if the property is land, means that it can be not land. And if you look at the definition of property under the Constitution, we find that it, through various types of law, would include immovable as well as immovable property, would include intellectual property, 
And when would that then be used, expropriation as a, as a tool? And what impact would that then have, obviously, on investors in South Africa and that? So is it limited to land, as we as a group sitting here today understand it to be? Or is it meant to extend further to include intellectual property rights, rights to shares, rights to anything that a person may have, an antique painting that might be hanging in your home, or it might be your horses or your cattle. Yeah. So that's my question to you, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm taking five. Okay. Um, and then after that will be the first round after you, ma'am. Um, good evening, everyone. Liesl Pretorius, Freedom of Religion South Africa. My question is, how does the department plan to protect the religious freedom rights in terms of Section 15 and 31 of the Constitution of property owned by religious institutions and communities and or used for religious purposes to ensure that South Africans' right to religious freedom is not violated? Thank you. Thank you very much, ma'am. I recognize you. Oh, my question is, um, you know, we have so many occupations in our community. Uh, oh, Kashiva Ahmad Housing Assembly. So I want to know, because there's some areas where people stay over 20 years in these informal settlements. Are those lands also going to be expropriated? Because we've seen there's so many... Um, companies, or how do you call them, that are owning these pieces of land. It's also like a tool that they are using also, because it's also like to the highest bidder. And you know, people feel very insecure in these pieces of land where they are being threatened, also they're going to be evicted. So are those pieces of land also going to be expropriated? And we also would like to know who was the rightful owners of that land before they own these pieces of land that is there. And then also I would like to speak to title deeds within our community. You know, we have communities that's been staying in these houses, flat rental flats for over 40 years. And there's still today people that don't have the ownership of those title deeds. So I also would like to know about those title deeds. When is it going to happen in our poor communities? Thank you very much. I think those are the fir first round for the questions, Mr. Lika. I'm going to hand over to you, sir. Thank you, Chair. Um, I will try my best to to respond to most of uh, the questions posed. Um, the first one relates to the power of the president and the premier to expropriate and whether the constitution authorizes uh, expropriation. Yes, uh, the constitution does uh, authorize expropriation uh, in section 253 uh, of the constitution 1996. Uh, and uh, the starting point in, in my in my in my presentation was around the authority. Where do we derive the authority to expropriate? Uh, the basis for expropriation or the basis for us drafting this legislation uh, arises uh, from the constitution it, itself, and we are we are trying to give effect to section 25 of uh, the constitution or the property clause. So that is where this bill derives uh, its authority. Uh, in respect of uh, whether the president um, and the premier have authority to expropriate, I have indicated in my presentation that uh, they are expropriating authorities across the three spheres of government who are empowered by legislation to expropriate. So if there is specific legislation that empowers the president or the premier to expropriate, then 
they will also be regarded as expropriating authorities. But right now, as I'm speaking, I don't know if there is a legislation that empowers the president to specifically expropriate or the premier to specifically expropriate. But all I know is that there is legis there are many pieces of legislation across the three spheres of government, which uh, grants uh, uh, organs of uh, of state uh, and government departments uh, the authority to to expropriate. The the next question is around uh, agent uh, expropriation. Um, is there a, pro a, 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 a process uh, that a, a premier can can follow uh, to expropriate for for certain purposes? Um, I have also indicated in my presentation that uh, this bill. Uh, intends to achieve a uniformity of procedure for all expropriating authorities across the three of, uh, spheres of government to expropriate. So if the premier possesses the authority in terms of a particular piece of legislation to expropriate, the premier will have to use that piece of legislation together with the procedure set out in this uh, in this bill to expropriate, but also um, the if it is for an agent expropriation, it has to comply with the requirements of the bill. One of the requirements is that it must be for purposes that are covered by the Disaster Management Act, or if it is in relation or following. A court order. So, if it is within those parameters, then the premier will be able to 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 expropriate. And uh, remember, an expropriation. One of the threshold requirements for expropriation to take place is that it must be for a public purpose or in the public interest. So, so whenever an expropriating authority expropriate, those requirements have to be satisfied even for an agent expropriation. The other question is about uh, the, the likelihood of uh, the impact on investments. Uh, my, 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 my view is that uh, the bill sets out a procedure for an expropriation. There is not going to be an arbitrary process of expropriation. And obviously, it will have to comply with, because the, the, the procedure will be well known beforehand by an expropriating authority for any purpose. There is not going to be any arbitrary expropriation taking place. So there wouldn't be room for any orderly government, uh, functioning of government to be disturbed. And over and above that, uh, we have a piece of legislation uh, called uh, the Protection of Investment Act uh, that was passed, I think, about three years back, two or three years back. And uh, we also participated uh, in, 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 you know, uh, made our views uh, available or on the on the bill itself. So there was interaction in respect of issues of uh, of uh, investments. And uh, during the the drafting of this bill, we also participated uh, in. Uh, there were the the department of uh, I think it's when it was still called trade and industry, once uh, arranged uh, workshops uh, around uh, bilateral investment treaties and so on. We were also part of those processes, so we were fully apprised of uh, you know all the, this, the the situations that have to be taken 
care of uh, in respect of the likely impact of this bill. So I can uh, safely say that uh, I don't think uh, there would be any uh, negative impact uh, that could be occasioned by this bill on investments and so forth. <coughs> the the right of uh, 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 religious freedom is is a right that is protected uh, like all other rights uh, in the in the constitution, and uh, as uh, we have already indicated in the presentation that the approach that will be used when uh, there is a, a decision to expropriate would be the balancing of rights approach uh, in terms of which the rights of uh, the private person are taken into account and the public interest is also taken into account and there is a balancing and then a decision is taken. So again, the answer is that there will not be any arbitrary uh, expropriation taking place. Expropriations will be procedural in terms of the requirements of the bill itself, which requirements also must mirror the requirements of the constitution. So everything will be constitutional. And the limitation of any right, any person who's got a right, must also satisfy uh, Section 36 of the Constitution. So um, there will not be any arbitrary deprivations of, of, of property. And um, I, I think also the same, the same approach goes for for persons who have been staying on informal rights and so on. Uh, the, the process to expropriate uh, will be will be as, as required by or in respect of a particular expropriating authority. Uh, in respect of informal settlements, I mean, if it's issues of house, human settlements and so on, Obviously, the, the functional area of human settlements is the functional area of the Minister of Human Settlements and the counterpart in the province. And uh, obviously, if they have to expropriate, they will have to follow the due process and so forth. So, uh, Chairperson, I think uh, that was Thank you very much. I need a favor. Cell phones on silent because I nearly ran out of here and it was a ringtone. So can we check our phones that are on silent? Just put your cell phone out and don't switch them off because if there's an emergency, you'll just have to quietly so move outside to take the call. But while we are still having this conversation in here, try to put it on silent. And I know you are going to do that because you want to hear also everything that has been said. I want to open up for questions again. Um, okay. I want to start here. Any questions from this? I just spoke about the cell phone. Just now, like, like literally now. And it happened, I faced this site and there's a cell phone. Okay, there's no questions here. I, I see you say. And then I saw you, ma'am, and then she saw it's one, two, three, four. In that order. Over to you, sir. Um, thank you, Chair. My name is Nazif Sonda. I'm a small scale farmer in the Philippi Horticulture area. Uh, I'm here in, uh, to represent the Philippi Horticulture area PHA campaign. Uh, my question to the honorable person there is <clears throat> what is the process? for a local community, um, which is affordable, accessible, um, uh, to start an um, expropriation with or without compensation process, a procedure, all right? And who, is it, who, who do the local community address um, such a claim to? Uh, um, in the local, there are three tiers of government, local government, provincial government, but who, who, um, 
who do we actually address this a claim to? For example, a claim would be in a public interest on issues such as, you know, if a property owner is an absentee landlord and the land is being um, run, uh, ruined, run down, being dumped on, etc., or the land is um, farming land but not being used uh, in the um, in the um, provision of farming and, uh, and 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 producing food, all the land is being held, but it's destroying um, the natural resources, um, the biodiversity, the water, um, and land could be illegally dumped on, or wetland might be um, infilled. So my question is one. Um, um, what is the process to start such a EWC cl claim and to whom must a local community address this claim to? Thank you. Thank you very much, ma'am. Mm -hmm. so, um, ma'am, I just want to find out, I am sorry that they bring up community again. But I am staying 22 years in that house since 2001. And since I didn't move into that house, I did receive a written tax paper to that house. But I did sign a lease agreement with Communique in 1995. I did move in 2001, the 8th of December. And um, for my knowledge, if you get a receive a written tax paper, it's supposed to be a private owner's house. But I just sent it back until they evicted me of the house 2017 because of saying that I didn't pay my rent, but I said it was the purpose of everything that I did pay the rent and they take me to court to say I did not pay for three years and I got all the papers, all the details, everything. But what I want to bring up to you guys, I said thing if I go to the dish office, they say it's no owner, it don't exist. And then I sat with the rent paper, I can tax paper that they get. They did cancel my lease agreement. But I'm still go, I'm still in court. So in that case is I must pay communique and I sat with the rent and tax paper. Which one do I really pay and which what I'm doing actually is for me is I'm sitting in they say I must put my children out of the house, then I can stay in the house because they're supposed to work already and they're supposed to be on their own because they're adults. Like the, the world is now, there's no work. There's nothing for them to go to if there's a three months captivity of work for them that is the most they can get. And if my children is on the street, where do they go to? I'm facing the eviction now, I must be the 14th of, January, of July and I must be again in court for the eviction that is since, since 2017. But if you go to communicate, they're not to be found to talk to. So they say, we must come, we must come speak. They will meet us halfway, but they never meet you. They never come to you. They never approach you on anything. So where does it leave us? The people they put up the houses, then put the people in back into other houses because that's all what they can say. <coughs> but we just want to know where we stand and what we can do about all the situations that we are in and that we approach with them. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. And I think, like, like I said, that's going to be difficult because of it's a, it, it might be the same place, but different scenarios. Hence, I said, fortunately enough, we've got the HOD of infrastructure here listening. So the ideal thing is to get your name, your contact details, and then we make sure she will have the copy, I'll have the copy, and the members of the standing committee are here, and we'll do the follow-up to find out what is happening about those issues that you are raising. So now because we are, de we are dealing with a bill, I want you to make sure your name and contact details on the on the register is there. And then if you didn't specify that it's you come from a place, a communicate or something, please go to the register again so that you can write and we can identify all of you that have the issues. 
and my procedural officer also is here. We'll put that on our program for the standing committee to also interact with the department itself and communicate. I don't know that rental place, whether it's the city one or the provincial one. I still have to find out from the, the, the HOD also have to find out whether it's the provincial or the the city, but it doesn't exclude us in doing an oversight to find out what is happening. Just give me the information so that we can move forward. I won't have the answers today, and HOD won't have the answers today. Surely National won't even have the answers also today. But I promise that what we can do is we can do the oversight to try to find answers for all of you with the questions that you have about the title deeds, about being evicted and everything. So that is what we can do. Um, and I can commit on behalf of the standing committee as the members are all here. So make sure we get your contact and then we will attend to it that way. And Shumise, which is our procedural officer, will communicate with you to update all of you if you have the contact details to say what is the step, first step that we are going to do immediately after we, we, we get into the committee to say how do we deal with the issues as you raise them. I hope that will help and we can continue with the questions about the bill because that one I promise we'll deal with it. Um, work with me. Otherwise, we are going to sit here until late and I, I want to ask to talk about the submissions about this bill, please. Um, already I've chosen there, you will come on another round because already I've identified some other people there. Over to you, sir. Good day, everybody. I'm Frederico Hendricks. Um, I've got, I think, might be controversial, but I think it's relevant. Um, I want to ask, is this um, gathering or meeting here today uh, for asking permission from community or society, or is it or consent, or is it just a tick in a box that you've done this? Or... Are we just you coming? We coming here? Just you going to impose something on us and saying we're doing this with your consent, with your permission? Doesn't matter what you ask or say. Uh, we we did listen to your questions. We did, you know what I'm saying. So we we I want to know if it's just a tick in the box or is it just you asking permission or consent? Number two, controversial but relevant question is. Um, <clears throat> We know that in terms of the first indigenous and the aboriginals and the Khoi and the San were the first nation of this country. So we know the laws that says that the person that has the right to expropriate or repossess um, is the owner. So in terms of the original first owners of this land, um, where does the first indigenous and the aboriginal and the coin sun stands? Is this now maybe to why the rust with this bow? Why can't we just still have time to workshop this with the community? And so that there be enough time for people to know what, like this gentleman said about people, if you say something in a language that people don't know, just say yes to something they don't. Like in the banks, they'll make you sign documents and afterwards you hear, no, so you signed, but you only had 15 minutes to get your approval, but they had six months to get to a cause on that thing. Now, this is laws. This is this is my learned friend. I asked the question here, so she uh, uh, wrote some postponed that this bill is not passed. Thank you. Thank you very much, Seth. Mantel to what is good selling him. A Kamaga Batan Rawak Kali, a Incokelia Sepumlan, Ipumlan case and full ending as a crescent. A quasi would be as a figure. A Umbuzoam now, Uzo one foot. A Eclego, La Lapesa, Africa Leech, Bau Mandela, Massif Gases and Zell. About to Baguti Gabafu and Yan Kesem. Bazen Zella, Baz Begali, who can say look Carolina, no government. But if you go into a nag in Abba, umpty in Botibin and a man's in a toilet, you question Yam Deba, 
bangenza njana okanye zeziphi amanyathi lomama baba wenza kwenzele bazozifumana njengoba sivukesa zenzela ke itoilet abantu bakuthi bazihombele bazenzele but ke wento singawazi ihomba ngamanzi and njengenkokheli eh funeka ezinye izinto ndizijonge inkalo zonke ngoba abantu in the Tibetan toy, put a lot of the toy, and if only gets into the toy toy, Lily Penny Shobes no ends and allo, or when the lessons are back against toy toy in. And also in the state of Abatali, but Abatal, as you were a ganga, footy, as if man is in conso, in Tony, a bangle as game was a forte, Zeng and Cocaine, and this jungle was in Jalo, so they tell a good singlet, a singlet, a gale, a band of a secumla, and a bezu, as a figure, but five years ago, but here, or two thousand and nineteen, so the actor like. No, no, Tata, Usa, Usa, no, I'm not cutting you. Okay, Mama. Yeah. Um, I think there was a race. But, okay. I knew that. Oh, um. Okay. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, and then where's the closer part of it? Um, so I'm sorry because when we started, I, I, I sort of indicated that those who mm. don't um, understand the, who wants to listen in closer or the, 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 um, we do have these devices to listen to, and by that time you were not in. So my apologies because I didn't repeat it. But if you do have this in front of you, channel when you six. channel four, you will hear Africans. Channel six is English or is closer. So if a person speaks closer, the English will be on channel six. You have to press to six. And then if there's English you want to hear in closer, you will have to press six again. So this you go to the equipment like this in front of you, and then this is what you use to listen those languages. And then if you need help, just raise a hand if you can't hear anything, and then you'll get someone to come to someone to come to you to listen to. Okay, Tata, you were okay, you were done. And go see. I ditingobabeni into a Tibene and a toy toy, Tiazamo put in the Zival and Gobani, in Cocaly upper Ebona and Gobabandu, but Cabeto toy, but she says it's in Tongom sources out the phone. So there's a moist top and on the lake or to get a pressure if man and a same Vasali and Goba, but Iminaga Michan will see Kelly was now as if man in cons. But the Babi again, a little queer vote of Lunyak Zayotina Suzu vote, Dean Cocaly and Ogumel and a lot of vote of Balegi. What I have not seen from my mind, I eat my hands bent. Tabule, Tamak. Encos. Okay, over to you, sir. Um, Chair, can I just suggest, I mean, we started the meeting and we all agreed we were going to speak English. Um, and that's why we didn't even worry to put this thing on our this thing. Could we just do a simple translation in English and we, don't, we all understand? Okay, like I just said just now. So immediately when he's speaking, when you take this, there's an immediate translation. So we don't have to wait for after he's done that you can hear English. So you take this as a person stand up, speaks Africans or is closer or English. The language that you prefer, you just go to the translation. You listen on this and not to the person. So the translation is immediate. So pick up that. So the, there is the I'm not going to stop anyone if they want to speak in Skosa or any other language because each and every one have got every right to speak with the language that they are comfortable. And it might be when we started, everybody agreed to the English that they don't need translation, but still, I still organize the translation for just in case if there are others that don't um, want to change to Skosa because we've been, this time of the day, you usually find your English or your Skosa, they are gone. 
So you switch on to Africa, and so we need to accommodate there. That it, it happens that you listen, and for whatever reason, then you think in the language that is different. So, but I'm accommodating each and every person. Just listen immediately. There's no translation that comes after. Over to you, sir. Yes. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Gabriel Kraza. Um, fellow of IRR and of IRR Legal. Um, Two-part question. Uh, one is a follow-up. Um, reference was made to, aren't you worried about chasing away investors? And you said, well, you've heard advice from uh, DT, well, other departments uh, that say the investment is not going to be a problem, it's not going to run away. I want to know if you can name a country uh, or countries where there is expropriation without compensation on the books uh, and where this has had a positive impact on investment and jobs, especially for the poor. One, to try to strive for that. But when I read this bill, it says, if I can just read in clause, I think it's clause 3C, notwithstanding registration of ownership in terms of the deed registries, Act of 1937, where an owner has abandoned the land by failing to exercise control over it, it can be expropriated without compensation. Does this mean if somebody comes to invade my house and I can't chase them away, I phone the police, they don't come, they slow, as, as is known to happen in this country. Then, after some time, that criminal will in fact become the owner and I will become the one dispossessed. I will be expropriated without compensation because of this clause, because I have failed to exercise control, because I'm not strong enough to chase them away and the police are not fast enough to help me. And if it doesn't mean that, that someone can take my property and then the government can take away my title deed too, then what does it mean? That section, please. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, how many questions? Uh, Jay, the problem is that it's not about the the, the honourable gentleman said that the Do the, me the a land favor. is abandoned. I think you were here. If the land is abandoned, then you you were you are, here. You are expropriated. You were here unlawful. when I said I have to recognize you. The lags are of pressing the button and just talking is uncalled for, because we agreed that how are we going to proceed with the program today without interruption and it sort of undermines the others that have really waited for you when you were talking and then they waited for you to speak and they are waiting for their chance to speak so let's be respectful to and be mindful of the time of the others that came to have the conversation or to come and do the submissions as you are here to do the same thing Say, I recognize you at the, at the end. Yeah. You can come closer to the mic. And again, for the last time, each and every person have got the right of the questions or the submissions or their opinions without anyone from the floor, including myself, to correct or to have an opinion about the submission or the question. So let's stick to that principle for us to continue because it's going to be a debate. If you say something, I'll have to allow him to respond to or clarity to about what he is saying. So I don't want us to get into that space. Over to you, say. I'm sorry about that. Thank you. We greet everybody here. Yeah? I'm Mario Polzer. I'm a chief from Ibiqua Royal Family. I represent them. I would like to know section 25, clause 8. Why was it taken out? You can answer that. And then I would like to know about I have a house and I would like to get the house of my name. But I went to FMB and they told me I must pay 6,000 Rand. Can you be of help, please? Thank you. Thank you very much. I think that's the, the, the last question. And then we'll go to the submissions. Oh, okay. How many questions do we have there, Mr. Likat? It's less than five. 
four. Four. Okay. I'm going to take the fourth one. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, I'm not covered. My name is Mujemba Bambani. So immediately she's going to speak first. Immediately take this and press number six if you want to hear in English. My name is Mujemba Bambani. I'm also from Fuleni, from an organization called Chronicles Empowerment Organization. Um, uh, our country called Gain Galay, Slavery, Alipia. so, I I I I I I I I I There's a land for communities but as it was to the young city Masilina Glenda, so you are like a city Yabuchikeles, Ungena Gromia, Unia Chikeles, so as following such a state, Uba Uba was on the next following, but Narish and Yeso scholars, the Connors called Sakas and Manaso, but giving again in the Nelandi, Saga, Banamasio Sedenza Singa Batal, Nasa Sedenza is called Abapan, the Bandana, Siba Dallas, Singaban, who never see. I think that was the last question. Then we can start with the submissions. Amelika, over to you, sir. Thank you once more, Chair. Uh, this time around, uh, there were more difficult questions than than before. <laughs> I will I will try my best. Um, the the first question is about uh, whether communities, if communities, if I understood it well, if communities would like to initiate an expropriation based on a variety of reasons. How can they do it, and who they do they do they go to? Uh, in respect of how this issue affects this bill, all I can say in, uh, on this one is that 
Uh, I have already indicated in my presentation that uh, only the state can exercise the power to expropriate. No private persons can expropriate property. But having said so, uh, I must also just explain that because there are many expropriating authorities across the three spheres of, of, of government who expropriate in respect of their areas of uh, their functional areas of service of, of, of legislative uh, competence. What does that mean? It means that expropriation itself is not a program of government. It is not there is no program in government that is budgeted for, which is called expropriation. But there are programs of service delivery which are budgeted for. And to achieve those programs, expropriation as a measure can be used to achieve those service delivery areas. Let me give an example. If you want to lodge, you, you, you have lodged a, a, a restitution claim, a land claim, and uh, the Department of Rural Development is, has declared it to be valid and it is busy processing it. One of the things that the Department of Rural Development and Land Reform can do to restore that land back to its rightful owners would be to use expropriation to acquire that property for restitution purposes and restore it to the rightful owner. In other words, uh, expropriation would take place within the context of a particular program of government. In this respect, in this case, it would be the restitution of land rights. So rest, uh, expropriation is never used as a tool arbitrarily to, at any given moment, acquire property. Uh, you know, when you, you're working and you see a piece of land and then you say, no, this one can be expropriated. Uh, let me phone uh, councillor so-and-so that uh, we have identified a piece of land that must be expropriated. That is what must be avoided, and it is an arbitrary thing. Uh, this is not what this bill says. Uh, th this bill says expropriation will take place for a public purpose or in the public interest. And the initiator of an expropriation is the person who holds the power to expropriation, and it is the state that can expropriate in the public interest or for a public purpose. And when we say for a public purpose, for instance, the state can expropriate to build houses. Houses is something that is in the public interest. So the Department of Human Settlements or the municipality can initiate that process to build houses and expropriate land for that purpose. So a community is not going to approach the Department of Human Settlement and say, we want you to expropriate. But based on the needs of a community, which are covered by a program of that department, the department might deem it necessary using its legislation to, to expropriate in order to deliver houses to, to people. So that is how I can try to, to respond to that one. The, the other question, um, is about uh, the issue of uh, Section 12.3 and, uh, and, and uh, the, the reference to countries that have succeeded uh, where, when they were doing without compensation, when they were expropriating 
without compensation. Um, the, the answer to this one is that uh, if you read this bill carefully, you will realize we have, in, we have stated that this bill seeks to give effect to Section 25 of the Constitution, which is the property clause. And when an expropriation takes place, one of the requirements, general requirements that must be satisfied in the Constitution itself is Section 36 of the Constitution, which is the general limitation provision. So when an expropriation takes place, this bill in, in, in Section 12, uh, you don't read Section 12.3 alone in isolation. Uh, you read Section 12 as a whole, from one to the end. In other words, an expropriation does not take place. The objective of an expropriation is to achieve a public purpose or a public interest. The objective of an expropriation is never nil compensation. Compensation is not the objective of an expropriation. Uh, compensation is the consequence, is the result of a, an expropriation. When you are expropriated for a public purpose or in the public interest, you have to be compensated. And how does that compensation happen? All the facts and circumstances have to be taken into account. You start from, from the beginning. It is an evaluation that you start with. You don't start at 12.3. You don't start by saying, I'm going to expropriate you for nil compensation. That is a wrong approach. You start by saying, uh, I'm going to expropriate you for restitution purposes. And I have looked at factor A to Z, and factor A to Z says, after all the, having done all the evaluation, therefore I can give you either five cent or zero. And the evaluation starts with, because the standard is just an equitable compensation. In other words, at the end of the day, if you are going to say compensation should be nil compensation. It, it means that in that particular case, because there's not going to be a blanket approach, in that particular case, it has to be regarded as just and equitable, looking at the facts and circumstances of that particular case. In other words, you will look at those factors that we have referred to as, for instance, current use of the property, the history of the property, market value, uh, direct investment purpose of the property before you go to clause 12.3 that deals with uh, the person who have lost control of their property. You don't start with the person who have lost control of the property, therefore we are going to expropriate you. No. You start with the evaluation after you have dealt with the public purpose or the public interest. So I think that is the main difference between our expropriation and maybe the, the expropriation that takes place in um, some, some, of the, some of the countries. Uh, I do not have information about uh, examples of uh, uh, countries that uh, do not pay uh, compensation. But our, ours is not without compensation. It is nil compensation. And there is a huge difference between without compensation and nil compensation, because nil compensation requires do, you to do an evaluation, whether you're going to pay compensation at the end of the evaluation or not. But without compensation means you are starting by saying, I'm expropriating you for a public purpose or for a public uh, interest, but I'm not paying you any compensation. So that's the difference. Chair, I think I've, I've, I've covered all the questions. Thank you very much. And for the question of the 
I want to go to the, so the bill itself have been um, sent to us. And so the committee is complying presently with the section 118 of the constitution and standing rule 72 of the provincial parliament standing rules which says the provincial parliament must facilitate public involvement in the processes of its committees as required by the constitution of which we are doing that with the public hearing so the the bill get to be referred to the province it originated in the national parliament in the national assembly it's not the provincial bill so it gets to be referred to us from the National Council of Provinces for the public hearings. So now we are in the process for the submissions from the communities. How do they feel about this bill? Because this bill has to be the communities that have the buy-in or decline it. But you have to give the reasons. That is why we have to get the submissions and then as the province, our responsibility is to compile those metrics and formulate the negotiating mandate, getting from um, from the metrics that we we receive, and then we send back to the um, NCOP. And once the negotiating mandate is submitted to the NCOP, the committee will meet again Friday on the 28th July for the consideration of the final mandate. So we will send the negotiating mandate to the NCOP. And then after they have gone through the negotiating mandates from different provinces, they will send the final mandate to us for us to look at. And then that will be the 28th of July, 2023. So this is part of the process of the bill itself that responsibility is for us as the Western Cape to do the public hearing. And as for Mfuleni, Mfuleni, we will have to get the specifics. And again, the HOD of infrastructure is here listening to you. That is why she got to grab the, the translator quickly so that you can hear what are the issues in Fuleni. Is that lady there? You can um, give a, the specific, your specifics, the contact details. You've got the pen. I supplied you a pen and a, a small book like that so that you can write and, and we can so that she can look at that issue. But already on the register, I tend to believe your contact details is there for the standing committee also to have a look at that. Those are the issues that we cannot give the answer now, but we can always go back as soon as possible to prioritize to have a look of what is happening and also hear it from the department, what is it that needs to happen. Now, like one mentioned that there are different spheres of um, of, of um, government. We've got the local, which is the city and the province. Fortunately for the province, um, we can do an oversight to ask the city what is happening, but HOD cannot do that. So that is why we have to get the details of where and what is happening so that as a standing community, we go and communicate with the right sphere of government who can try to find the answers because now you want the answers to all those issues that we have raised. So we will try to, um, okay. So we will try to make sure that we, 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 we look into that. So we are going to have a break, not now. The time that I say is break. Communique and you also Fuleni, can we get your contacts? We'll have a spreadsheet where you can register again for those specifics that it's not about the bill itself. It's about issues that you are raising so that we separate that because, because it's totally different from each other. That is, ma'am? Okay, you can switch on the mic. You are the last one. I was going to start now to go to the submission. Afrikaans gemeng, baie dankie vir hierdie geleentheid en um, dankie vir die gemeenskap wat deel is van hierdie uh, gesprek vanavond. Ek uh, het gekom vanavond om te praat oor pijn en suffering en dan bring ek ook 
vir human settlement in. As a hierder vir meer as 20 jaar, as ek op a wachtlijs vir oor 30, 33 jaar, en ek rent vir meer as 20 jaar, so ek het vanaan gekom, maar ek refer ook na die bil toe, wat praat rondom human settlement. En dan is het dat ons het mense wat krimpeer van, van evictions, letter of the man, court cases, all senior ladies stand in court to face evictions. And that is so it's so, I don't know how to say that word, but as for my net, who can a old man van 80 years old in a horse stand for a eviction? The letter of the man, it's like a movie that play in Vietnam because when they knock on your door, it's your time now. Your, your, your furniture, they came per truck and the whole army, they came. And they take your stuff, they don't even, they bang your doors open, they take your stuff and they dump your stuff there on an open field. Your children come from school and they saw all the trauma, what is going on here. So I want to know, next year is election, then all the government is with us to sympathize us. But... We are here and I hear about the bill and I'm so sorry because we came out for help. Because you are the government, I'm not belong to a landlord and I'm not making my mark for a landlord. Thank you. Thank you very much. And um, I, hear, I hear you, ma'am. The only thing that we can say, I will repeat like I was um, already sounded like I missed the, the, the scratch, but I allowed you to speak so that you can ventilate and because it's a, a frustration and we acknowledge that for you to come here, that means you, you really are needing help. So we look at that, make sure that you go to the table to write your name, your contact details, and all those different issues that you are facing so that we can try to, to, to address them through the department. And the HOD also has been listening. We'll look into that and uh, communicate. Without wasting any time, I'm going to open up for the um, submissions. So the submissions now is oral submission. But the written submissions is still open until the 9th of July. So if it can be that you feel you now have a clarity about the bill from National, you are going to write your written submission. Yes, you are allowed. Shemiz, if you can put your, the number. So you've got, you can do the email. You can do submission with a voice note on the WhatsApp or you can do um, write the WhatsApp for your submission. But all, always, when you do the submission, don't forget to put your name there and also your personal info there, your name, surname maybe, and the contact details. So again, I repeat, you still have until the 9th of July to make a written submission. I did receive the names of people that said they are going to do oral submissions. I'm going to start with them. I do have seven names. Then after those seven names, I'll open up the floor for those that didn't register their names to do the submission until I've covered each and every one of you. We are not going to go until we get all your submissions. So I'm going to start with Ms. Lizelle Pretorius for Faith and Freedom South Africa. And after it will be Daniela Ellebeck, Freedom of Religion South Africa. Ma'am, that's, that's with one organization. <laughs> okay. Wendy Leskosana, member of the public. Are you here? Okay. Are you doing the submission also? Okay. Neville Peterson, you're doing the submission. Thank you, sir. 
Miss Amy Badley, Agri South Africa. You're doing the submission. Thanks, ma'am. Tyler Dallas. Taylor Dallas. Okay, it's not here. Also indicated will come to do the, the submission. Ms. Musidi Milamu, the Banking Association South Africa. Okay, let me check online. Um, Nicholas Diaz, are you going to do the oral submission, sir? Uh, chairperson, no, I'm not sure why I'm indicated as a presenter on Teams. I'm not presenting today, Chair. Okay, thank you very much, sir. I think those are the ones that are going to do submission. And then from there, when we are done with the um, Neville Peterson, uh, no, Miss Amy Badley, then you can raise your hand for the submissions for those who want to do submission, then I'll recognize you. Let's start with you, Miss Pretorius. Thank you, ma'am. Liesl Pretorius, Freedom of Religion, South Africa. Uh, next slide, please. Um, for SA, we're a legal advocacy organization. Our focus is the constitutional protection of the right to freedom of religion. Next slide, please. And, of course, the constitutional protection of freedom of religion is set out in sections 15 and 31 of the Constitution. And this fundamental right includes the right to practice your faith and community with others, and the state is duty-bound to fulfill these rights. Next slide, please. Our interest in the expropriation both stems from the fact that religious communities can and many do own property and or use property for religious purposes. In other words, property ownership and or its use is intrinsically linked to the exercising of religious freedom rights and religious communities rights. So expropriation of property owned by religious communities and or used for religious, of religious purposes will have a severely detrimental impact on the religious freedom and religious community rights of those communities and even the public good. As we all are probably aware, the faith communities of South Africa do tremendous work to help the poor, the sick and others in need. Next slide, please. Our substantive concerns are... Concern clauses 1, 12, and 20 of the bill. Um, oh, the previous slide, just one back. No, one back. There we go. The definition of property. Our concern is um, we recognize that the overall objective of the bill seems to be the expropriation of land and certain land-related property rights. However, the definition of property is not limited to the bill because it's linked to the Constitution, Section 25, and, and that section of the Constitution does not limit the definition of property to land. And also there are no exceptions for certain types of land, specifically land used for religious purposes. So without a limitation of the definition of property to land, um, it can mean, property can mean anything from, to, from land to shares to the clothes on somebody's back. Next slide, please. Coming to expropriation without compensation, we are first of all um, concerned by the constitutionality thereof. Expropriation without compensation will not only affect property rights, but it will also affect religious freedom rights. The critical question is whether the expropriating religious communities' property without compensation is a reasonable and justifiable limitation of their right to religious freedom. We uh, applaud that there's a list of criteria for expropriation without compensation, but we see that it is an open list that creates legal uncertainty. We would suggest that the list be changed to a closed list. There are also, like I said, no exceptions for property um, used for specific purposes. Uh, next slide, please. Our other substantive concerns relate to that the bill allows for urgent expropriation of property for up to 18 months and potentially with no compensation because it says just an equitable compensation. But that can mean no compensation if you read the bill as a whole. And then with in certain circumstances relating to specifically national, na national disasters um, without any judicial oversight, we feel that that is problematic. We also feel that the bill likely falls foul of South Africa's binding international law obligations under the Banjul Charter, which requires land reform to meet a public need. So in conclusion, the constitutionality of the bill is questionable. 
because not over a year and a half ago, the National Parliament rejected the Constitution 18th Amendment Bill, whose specific purpose was addressing this issue of expropriation without compensation. That bill was rejected. That means that the Constitution, Section 25, stands that it is. The Constitution says payment must be just and equitable. But the question is, what does just and equitable mean? So the constitutional question is, and there isn't a clear answer on this, is whether no compensation can ever be just and equitable. So we say that this bill, with its by allowing for no compensation, which practically means, as the end result, expropriation without compensation, is premature. It's putting the cart before the horse. Um, so our recommendations. Uh, next slide, please. So to just one more. There we go. So to, in order to just improve the bill, we say limit the definition of property in Clause 1 to land and land and appropriate affected land-related property rights. Make it explicit. Also, we ask this committee, or even the Western Cape Provincial Parliament, to approach the Constitutional Court for a declaratory order regarding whether no compensation as proposed in certain clauses of the bill, specifically sub-clauses 12, 3, and 4, um, whether no compensation qualifies as just an equitable payment as required by the Constitution. And in the absence of constitutional clarity, we would suggest that all provisions relating to expropriation without compensation be removed. So that would be clause 12 sub 3. And if that clause remains, at least make that open list a closed list of criteria so that we know that we're talking about what we're talking about. And also in clause uh, 12 sub 4, if that should remain, um, clarify what all relevant circumstances mean. Because we cannot decide on a law and know what its impact will be if there are terms that are vague and broad and undefined. We simply then do not know what we're dealing with. Uh, next clause. Oh, sorry, yeah, that's right. We would also uh, suggest that a clause be inserted <laughs> exempting land owned or used um, by religious communities from expropriation. We have a suggestion there for legislative text. And they would also suggest that the de definition of public interest be aligned with the Banyol Charter. Its full name is the African Charter on Human and People's Rights to meet a public meet, need, because the Banyol Charter says that when land reform takes place, it should meet a public need. So that to meet a public need section can just be inserted into the definition of public interest. And that would also improve the poll. Next um, slide, please. And finally, we would ask for the removal of clause 20 sub clause 2A. That provides uh, for the um, expropriation of um, property on an urgent basis um, without judicial oversight. Um, we feel that under no circumstances should there, there should always be judicial oversight if it's an urgent expropriation, even if it's a national disaster. If it's urgent, an urgent court order can be obtained from a high court. Um, that concludes our submissions. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you very much, Ms. Pretorius. I'm going to continue now to Kwandiles Kosana. Oh, you said you are not going to do it. It's Neville Peterson now. Yes, over to you, sir. So we'd like to amend the <clears throat> Section 25 of the Constitution of the Republic of South Africa. Um, this proposed amendment is to effect the expropriation of community property and land without compensation that was dispossessed and hijacked from the housing beneficiaries. Community tenant, community tenant beneficiaries are requesting the Western Cape Provincial Parliament Standing Committee on Infrastructure to hear our appeal once again to have our submission table before this committee, which was declined and censored um, in the past, hoping this submission will be allowed to be tabled by us orally at the forthcoming public hearing on the 21st of June 2023, relating to the expropriation of land and social housing properties Ill illegally occupied and hijacked by the apartheid uh, beneficiary communique formally operating as the Citizens Housing League White Group under the Apartheid Group Areas Act. This submission could not be submitted on time due to our challenges with load shedding, hoping that the late submission won't be held against us. The background on white settlers and Afrikaner housing schemes during the apartheid South Africa. In 1909, the British Parliament passed the South African Act of 1909, 
creating a union of South Africa under the British imperial crown. The white settlers in the union were allowed to govern South Africa with its white-only parliament. The first elections were won by the parties, party of General Boerta. The party presented broadly the interests of the British elite, British settlers, and the Afrikaans elite, um, settler elite. The opposition in parliament consisted of representatives of Afrikaans and nationalists under the banner of the Nationalist Party of the white um, workers left marginalized. In 1922, a national nationwide uh, mining strike was organized by the South African Commerce Party under the slogan, White Worker Unite for White South Africa. After the strike, the Nationalist um, Party mobilized the white workers, promising color bar as a policy to protect them from black worker competition. This mobilization was led by General Herzog. In 1924, the pact government of the Afrikaner elite and white worker came to power with the privileges of white workers as their core policy. A number of non-governmental white organizations were formed in order to take care of the white working class. Two of these apartheid demons registered in, the, in that area survived black liberation in 1994, namely Garden City, a white group, registered in 1928, and Citizen Housing League White Group, registered under registered in 1929. Cardinal City was responsible for creating towns for Afrikaner, elite, and the white working class. The Citizen Housing League White Group was established in 1929, which is now called Communique, and was responsible for housing um, the white working class. In 1994, these organizations hijacked the public land and property assets that they administered during the color bar years of General Herzog and the apparent years of General Malan, who came into power in 1948 and introduced the Group Act of 1950, which removed black and colored people from towns and created townships of Bantu stands for them. Kumniki and Garden City retained the property and land acquired from the apartheid state before the black liberation and the freedom of South Africa. They were retained and, and the, um, they also re, retained their tax exemption status and they also gained new privileges under subsidies, grants from, from the Department of Human Settlements and privilege, privileges from the municipalities, including the city of Cape Town and provincial government, including the Western Cape government. They also solicited um, and received donations from local and international philanthropist um, organization. They also illegally charged market rate the rent from social housing beneficiaries and progressively they weeded out um, the vulnerable poor and elderly from illegal evictions and recycling tenants with those who could not pay their the profit-making high rentals. Beneficiaries of community who were cash-strapped are further being strategically evicted by the highly paid legal advocates to accommodate foreign nationals who are charged and willing to pay astronomically fee high rentals, resulting in local beneficiaries who are in dire need of accommodation to be overlooked because of their financial disposition, which is a contributing factor to the housing crisis in Cape Town. Communique hired and instructed permanent lawyers at astronomical fees to carry out the evictions expeditiously in order to get around the legal requirements of finding an alternative accommodation for evicted tenants under the Legal Evictions Act. While spending beneficiary funding while spend, <clears throat> spending beneficiary funding on high and paid, highly paid advocates to evict housing beneficiaries and the lavish salaries of CEOs and the directors on um, ridiculous and wasteful expenses as the funds could have been better used to assist housing beneficiaries who are under the financial constraints. This cross-subsidization economic segregation business plan crafted by Communique is based on the ideologies of apartheid and forcibly affected tenants because of the age and economic circumstances. 
communique in collaboration with Garden City, sold to the city of Cape Town a parcel of land on the Wolverfee farm for an astronomical fee of 72 million rand to be Sorry, used as a... Tessin, can you... Um, you've got about 30 seconds left. Okay. Do you still have a lot to say? No. Okay, thank you, sir. Okay. Um, astronomical um, amount of 72 million rand to be used as a dumping ground for the tenants evicted by Communique and other landlords in Cape Town. This enabled Cape Town municipalities to present this court with certificates that they have alternatively accommodated the evictions. The proposed constitutional amendments as the a result of Communique's corrupt, inappropriate apparent legacy of crime, illegal land and property hijacking Community being birthed out of the apartheid said, we submit the following amendments to Section 25 of the Constitution, that all property and land stock in the portfolio of committee or community be expropriated without compensation, that social housing beneficiaries who were resigning in community housing <coughs> stock be issued with title deeds, that the land hijacked by community be expropriated without compensation to the state or social housing. Um, where property was acquired without payment through the nation's gift and through favorable low purchases prior to the 1994 by the apartheid state, and that the subs subsidiaries be expropriated without compensation by the relevant government minister. Where property rights and title deeds are held by entities who obtain these rights at no cost through the nation's gift or low favorable sales purchased from the apartheid government and its subsidies, that these rights and title deeds be expropriated without compensation to the property beneficiaries of occupying the premises. Where land was acquired from the apartheid state at no cost through donations, gift or ceded low favorable rates, that the land be expropriated without compensation to be used for social housing. Appeal to the Western Cape Parliamentary Standing Committee on Infrastructure. The community tenant beneficiaries are aware that the Democratic Alliance controls this committee and the DA publicly opposed the expropriation of land and property. But we request that this committee, the Premier, the City of Cape Town, the Executive Mayor, and DA use community as a case study to determine the historic. Owners Mr. of Mr. social Steve, housing. I don't want to 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 sound untowards, but you really. I I was I was so generous with the time, and you have exceeded about four minutes, and of which I was I'm giving three minutes. So with due respect, I said thirty seconds. You said yes. How much time do you still need? to finish uh, your sure. submission? Yeah. With all due respect, I thought you said earlier on when you opened up that we will all be allowed to talk and no limits will, time limits will be put on to our no. submissions. But I am nearly done. Um, and uh, yeah, so no, I it, think it's it, very unfair. It's, it's because not other going speakers were not given time, it, yeah, time it's, limits. The previous speaker really, really used about three minutes yeah. plus seconds. But and this then, was not told to me beforehand, or be to the meeting beforehand. Hence, but can I continue? It's nearly done. Okay, let me do it this way. Hence my saying that the submission, the written submission, even if you do the oral, we're still going to receive that. So the summarized version, like the first speaker has got a very long a submission that she did, but she did the summarized version because when we do the matrix, Everything that you are saying is going to be captured because you are going to forward it to that contact details. So for us to be able, because if I can give more time to each and everyone to use that specific time that you need, there's no way that we'll be able to reach the second bill and we still have another bill that we have to deal with. So please bear with me if I'm a little bit sounding like I'm selfish with the time, but it's for everybody to have a chance to also do the submission that came to do the submission. So the minimum time that we have, let's try to share it and, and not be selfish with it so that it can, we can distribute amongst ourselves equally. So. Yeah. Over to you, sir. Yeah, this is not the first time I'm being restricted um, by this committee. 
on several other occasions, we were told not to, you know, to submit this. So there's another indication that we are being um, targeted here um, in terms of the decisions. But can I continue and then all, uh, it's nearly done. I will appreciate if you can continue, but yeah. um, if you cast a special on saying that you, it, it, it's like you are targeted, the day has only 24 hours and we can use it as much as we can to make sure that we cover everything that needs to be done. You can continue and try to wrap up, say we will capture your uh, submission on the matrix. Yeah. Um that this committee within its powers respectfully refer this matter to the Premier of the Western Cape to conduct an independent forensic audit on how the apparent beneficiary community acquired the vacant land they stole, stockpiled under the apartheid government um, project, Swatkofar, and how they acquired the social rental properties that they hijacked and are now selling off at a profit. At the Executive Mayor, we um, that the executive mayor um, give an account as to why the city of Cape Town is still subsidizing the rates and taxes of these social housing properties, and the city of Cape Town are still hiding and protecting the Swatkofar land community hijacked um, by charging the zero rates and taxes. The narrative that community is a private company is blatantly untrue, and the city of Cape Town subsidies um, subsidizes communique as um, protection submitted by the, on behalf of the communique social um, housing beneficiaries. But I must reach the uh, unhappiness and the satisfaction. Yeah, thank you very much. Because again, it's not the first time that this standing committee has censored and shut us up. So I, I would like to, to register my, I don't debate it, but I just want to register um, our this is infection. Okay, thank you very much. And I was listening carefully to everything and most of the issues with the communique. Like I said, we have to engage also to deal with that because truly speaking, if I even make a submission, we we, we give that on the matrix to national, it's going to be referred back here so that we can try to deal with it. It might be what I'm saying is not what you agree with, but it's the process that has to happen for us to try to assist in dealing with the issue. And um, ma'am, may I please be excused? Yes, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Thanks for coming. Over to you, ma'am. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I am Amy Barkley, and I actually represent Agri SA as you mentioned, and I'd made contact with um, this committee and Ms. Jones directly just to find out if it would be possible for me to attend today's public hearing. But we have had a request um, from AgriSA to make a representation at the NCOP, is that correct? And that would then follow this. I'm just following the process. I'm new to AgriSA, so I don't want to make a mistake. So I don't want to waste this committee's time. Um, obviously, with any submission, if we will then be going to the NCOP, where I will then make submission on behalf of Agri SA. But at, at the end of the, if, is it fine if I make a short submission to this committee, ma'am? Yes, you can do the submission here. You are here. Yes, <laughs> thank you for the opportunity. Um, on behalf of Agri SA, obviously, you know, we represent a large portion of South Africa's rural uh, farmers and obviously also the commercial farmers and the people that will be highly impacted by the um, implementation of the expropriation bill. So irrespective of color, race or creed, we represent many, many of the farmers in our country and we are very committed to the transformation and development, but we want to see it completed in an orderly and uh, constructive manner. And we have some concerns around some of the parts of this um, proposed bill at the moment. Obviously we support the bill, but there are issues that are of concern for us. Um, and I'm going to just hit them off as uh, single liners. The first one is the definition of property. Um, as set out in the Constitution, uh, the bill seems to talk about land a lot, but actually if we look at the definition of property set out in the Constitution it, and the case law that followed, it really means everything from the car to your shoes to the house and your shares in your company. So that is a little bit broad and maybe we should look at making that a little bit narrower within the um, definition. I understand why the legislature used 
uh, 25, but I think it's a little bit broad. We might need to narrow that down a little bit. Um, the second one is obviously a uh, reference made by my learning colleagues to 12.3 and 12.4, which is the null compensation, which will always be the big concern, um, where farmers have mortgage bonds um, with financial institutions, and that is dealt with in, obviously, in the Act, we see that. But it does put pressure on our investment and financial um, institutions and farmers going forward and development farmers to gain access to further finance, you know. So it's an equitable aspect and it won't be arbitrary, but we have to mention those concerns. Um, the recourse to courts, I have just a quick question and maybe to deal with it, I, I had forgotten to ask it. The question, I see we have a new lay, uh, land court bill that will be going forward and that land court bill will precede this bill um, it's the land claim court, all of that stuff, and hence the need for a, a labour, a, a land court. But is it really going to resolve that issue? Are we going to find that this expropriation bill creates many, many more court cases, and will it be resolved quickly? And um, access to courts by uh, our farmers, and that is obviously an imperative aspect of our, our submission. And last one, you know... Um, is that we've seen many, and you'll see them our written submission, and, and, and please please note that, is there's been a lot of studies done on countries that have gone with legis legislation of this nature and the impact that that has had in those countries. And, you know, please take that into consideration and see where we could trim down on some things to make it as palatable as possible for both investment and those kind of things as well, while keeping transformation as um, a main goal for South Africa. But it's about the speed with which we can do this, and are we really going to achieve that with massive amounts of litigation? So I will continue you know, with a, a more detailed submission, but that's just the highlights, and I thank you and this committee for the opportunity to make this submission. Thank you. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, those are the names that I had on the list. So I'm going to open up for the submissions from the floor. If you can just raise your hand if you want to do the submission. And it, I'll start with you, and then you'll be number two and number three. In that order, number four. In that order, we are going to continue. I'm not going to stop on four. So if there are others you will raise after that, we continue with the submissions. Over to you, sir. Um, I'm very grateful for the opportunity, as well as for the answers earlier given and the clarity. Um, so as all, I think it's very helpful to hear the difference between expropriation without compensation and expropriation with no compensation is a matter of process. It reminds me a little bit of... Thank you so much. I've tried to speak up. Um, the, you know, once uh, I was robbed when I was studying in America and someone took the bank card and drew all the money and I phoned and I said to them, I'm very, very worried. I've got no rands in my bank account. And the lady said, no, don't worry. You've got no dollars in your bank account. And it sounds a little bit like that when I hear zero compensation or nil compensation. It's one form of nothing versus another. <laughs> but you've explained very nicely that in fact the difference comes down to procedure. And you know, this matter of procedure is very concerning to me. If I read the Constitution, Section 25.2b, it says property may be expropriated only in terms subject to compensation, the amount of which and the time and manner of payment of which have either been agreed by those affected or decided or approved by a court. All in the past tense, either the parties have agreed or a court has decided. But our submission is that if you look at this bill very clearly, it is possible for the expropriation to go through before the court has decided and without agreement from the parties. And I urge 
at this stage of the process for that error to be ameliorated? Surely to goodness, it could not have been on purpose that such a violation of the Constitution was smuggled in. It must have been an accident and it must be addressed at this uh, post-NA uh, uh, level of the, of the process. I won't go through all of our other submissions. We will make them uh, in writing, uh, as we have already to other uh, legislative bodies in the journey. Excepting I want to highlight one thing. If we look at, uh, just, to, just to drill down on this question of can you be expropriated first and then go to court later, just to explain the practicalities of it. If someone is expropriated, especially if the land that's expropriated is to do with their business, whether they're a farmer, whether it's their home and they work from home, or they depend on that home, they can't afford rent, or if they have some kind of bed and breakfast, something like that. When they're expropriated, where's the money coming from to go to court? If it's expropriation first, court later, where's the money to go to court? It's a problem. So when I look at, uh, at the clause uh, 2.2, I'll read it slowly. Subject to section 20, a power to expropriate property may not be exercised unless the expropriating authority has, without success, attempted to reach an agreement with the owner <coughs> or holder of a right and property for the acquisition thereof in reasonable terms. You can't have expropriation. It cannot be exercised unless the expropriating authority has failed to reach an agreement. Firstly, it's a confusion. When you find agreement on price, it's still an expropriation. The thing that makes it an expropriation is the fact that it's a compulsory acquisition by the state. It's not whether or not you agree on the price. But secondly, if you read through the whole bill, it's the first instance where this matter of timing is thrown in a confusing fashion so that it's not clear. First, you must either agree on the price and then you can do expropriation or you must go to court and the court must say the price, and then you can have expropriation. In fact, what the bill is doing here is it's making it very confusing. It's making it very easy to seem uh, to some expropriating authority, and it's been clarified for us, anyone can be an expropriating authority. The good gentleman doesn't even know if the president is on the list or the premier is on the list. That list is so vast, anyone can take your stuff, just as if they're in the government. Well, not anyone, but he doesn't know who's on the list or who's not on the list. So broad is the list. And if someone on that list is As confused... As you conclude, please. As you conclude. Thank if you. someone on that list is confused and they think they can take your land first and go to court afterwards, it seems very much that this bill is going to help them and it's going to hurt the people of South Africa. The rest of our submissions will be made in writing and we're very grateful for the opportunity to address this uh. point. Thank you very much for that summary. But as you can see on the screen, there's the email address where you can submit your written submission. Uh, I'm just a co-chair. As I enige person wat bereid is om enige submissions to mark. Op die vloer. Is there uh, anyone? On, on a point of order, we've been noted, noted already. Uh, there are four hands noted already. Okay. So I think we're just continuing in that okay. order. So who's, who's the next one? I am. Thank you. Just, just introduce yourself. My name is Kenneth Matlawe. I am a member of Housing Assembly, a grassroots uh, community-based organization that is engaged with uh, issues of access to land and housing, uh, anti-eviction and service delivery. In, in summary, yes, we, we welcome the expropriation bill, but uh, we cannot separate the issues of access to both housing and land. We cannot separate these things. Many are getting evicted from social housing and private rentals in areas with first-class amenities like the city center. On the other hand, most BNG and RDP, uh, even temporary relocation areas, are built on the periphery of the city. The bill then must especially include or make reference to spaces close to the city center. 
also in terms of limitation of rights, Section 36 of the Constitution must then apply heavily when it comes to points of compensation and market value, because uh, it would do no good if land is expropriated on one side and then taken away through evictions and market inflations that uh, render people unable to keep up with their rent. Therefore, any discussion on land expropriation must consider and include as well Section 26 of the Constitution. Land and housing must be addressed as relational and interrelational or as a uh, cause and effect uh, scenario. Secondly, uh, <coughs> my notes have gone. Udinga Manzi. Sela Manzi, Mr. Gwid. Busaza Gak, so Sela Manzi, not filing a bank. Housing and evictions, and we get very high. Secondly, we feel that too much powers are given to the minister. Uh, we feel that the minister is biased first uh, on the basis that they represent a particular political party in, in, in their positions. Secondly, they are also biased because they, they are under immense pressure to deliver and, 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 and be procedurally fair and democratic which is not what the bill refers to when it talks about just and equitable. So then we are saying since 195 of the Constitution talks about uh, uh, that the needs of people needs to be responded to and people need to be encouraged to, to, take, to participate in policy making. So we are saying then as, as Housing Assembly, instead of the minister having all these powers, create a joint committee a joint committee that will involve the minister, that will involve community residents, that will involve uh, civic uh, representation, instead of uh, uh, expropriating powers going directly only to the minister. Lastly, here today, in this, uh, in this meeting, in this session, most of the questions and comments on clarity came uh, on particular issues that people are facing, as people are seeing the expropriation bill as a means to access to something. This then is an indication, uh, or at least an indication of a failure on your parts. A failure that, yes, today you have translation of Afrikaans, Khosa, and, and English, but when you made this bill uh, available to be read so that we can come here today, you didn't give that. And the language also itself is legal jargon. It's not written in uh, a, a language that is directed to us, people on the ground who can be, uh, never went to school, uh, Bantu education and all this stuff. So you conclude, in, in conclusion, thank you very much. Don't call us to come and rub a stamp. Make sure that the language, if it's if something is addressed to us, then also that the language must be directed to us. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Who's next in line? You may continue, ma'am. Introduce. Thank you. My name is Susanna Coleman. I'm from the PHA Food and Farming Campaign. Um, in short, the PHA campaign supports the expropriation bill as proposed. And we would like to thank the committee for the work that they have done to make this, the contents of the bill accessible and understandable. Um, we, the PHA campaign represents a large number of landless farmers and farm workers who believe that the land in farming areas should be productive and not be kept fallow by developers trying to make a profit out of the land. And that is covered by one of the clauses in your in your bill, so we appreciate that. Um, we also believe that the concept of a just administrative action with regard to expropriation procedures will more than adequately more than adequately cover the concept of nil compensation, because there will always be circumstances under which a nil compensation is a just and equitable compensation given the history of this country. So thank you very much for the to the team who has made this available to us and we support the expropriation bill wholeheartedly. Thank you very much for that submission. Next. 
volgende. Is there no one that is has an appetite to make a submission? On go ahead, Craig. I'm not worried apparently. I'm not. I'm not yet to bow. Eh, we more than more than you need for what? Eh, ah, somebody can hear me. If I'm talking like this, yeah. yeah, okay. Thank you, people. Thank you. Then the full number. Kuba lo kuke di sa kuba legi le Yeah, everybody, good afternoon. Yeah, my name is Patrick Busugwana. I'm coming from Makaza Kailicha. Yeah, so I thank you so much for the time we have now here. But I'm not going to speak too much English. I just want to talk my language. As I ask first to the front line here, Enko sin banda kuto ndiyo bulela kaku minister kuni nonge basali everybody kaku lugha kulu lomke ndinati beskon basolo kwa sufu na paye zilali nikora ni sneti lengo sbiza kesi zoe mama la kufucha ne kaku lungo ba lendo yomshaba ispete kaku bi apostla la kona asifaga mandi kaku kora kwa nite na sbiza sasa zoe sabe la kufucha ne Sia kwa zi piteta kwa kisi kati sana pa kuba melo ni deto klali. Kuba lendo kuya bwana kalba. Njengu mba singa banda wa mnyama. Siyo higa atina na uzapa kwa zindao. We are very scared to come here. To ask as zindao. But kasi mizwa kwa minister bezo kati sana siya sivu ye. Matu wata sisenga gini kakulu. Siya ufunu mklaba. Siya ufunu mklaba. Siku azba emishabeni, sibe nende sienza yuko kuzuguta. We don't want to eat only tonight. We want to eat even tomorrow and next year and other years. But umshaba, it's the only one thing. Eskonda yuguti inga sneta kule meko siku yotasi songe. Iyasi vuyisa kule ndo nienzile masibu lele minister. Sitenko usikun matuta makuru. Noba gengugu asikuwa zanga ufumana ando ogwa ngugu. Kodwa uba nezao ya pambili na lomkimbi. Sia bulia la sia bonga kuni. Kanga ngubani sitike. Benda uteta. Kodwa nine temba lukuba. Nogo ez ndao sezi titiwe nga banyi. Nogo zifakele kakulu. Asina unibambeze langa klesha ke. Kodwa nisina eteba ndaku itu lendo ipumele elele. Sizenga yo apa kakulu. Ipumele elele. Inga chigesi tube nisipinde sibu yesive i results ze inuba zitini results inga yo. Singafu yange zite itike zbegoe zitike sao pinda ke sibega ande sao pinda sivu ba kwenze gandoni na. So I don't want to extend to talk. But now what you talking, we're talking one language. No matter is different language, but we're talking one thing. We need umshaba. We need umshaba. To progress, to progress our ideas to the ground. So I thank you very much, people, for you and the elders as well. You are here for this program. So what I just ask you, Sisi, you don't have even a coffee for the elders. You don't have nothing for the elders. We can drink coffee, please, man, please. At least for the elders, they must have something. At least, thank you very much, man, people, man. Thank you, man. People, they must have something, man. <laughs> Thank you very much. I think when you came in, they welcomed you with coffee, but they never welcomed me with coffee when I started sharing. And it's a bit cool. At least they switched off the air con. But we are going to take a break after the submission, and I saw already the coffee is out there. Ma'am, I recognize you. 
Thank you. Through the chair, I'd like to say that there is a feast and there is coffee in the members lounge at the end of the corridor. Thank you for covering me. You know, I appreciate people like you. Did you hear that? Any other submission? Okay. That being said, I think that was the last of the submissions. And I just want to um, thank all the members of the public for attending the meeting and really engaging into the bill. One thing about uh, honorable members, honorable members, I'm talking to you too. So I want to thank the public and also we know that I, Land is a very emotive and will never speak the same language because the the sense of ownership totally different. Are you raising your hands eh? or you are fixing the mic? Okay. So I just want to thank all of you for coming and there is a coffee like it's been announced at the end of the corridor and um, we are going to break now it's seven. Can we, can I allow you to drink coffee for 10 minutes and then we come back, we start with the housing consumer protection bill. Is that fine with everyone? Um, that means 10 past seven will be here for housing consumer bill. At least that one is not the one that, um, very yeah, very controversial. So, <laughs> no. Okay, let's break in straight through the coffee for you to be warm. 10 past seven. Stop. Let's meet in here. Thank you.
Goedenavond, mijn naam is Aletta Lottering en ik is een gemeenschap leier. Dankie van Rijtewag. Valtila, I'm a tenant for 20 years in Rijtewag. Tumaki Yose, um, Development Action Group. Uh, Tashrik Jaffa from uh, Western Cape Property Development Forum. You uh, and Michael, um, just from STBB. Uh, Ismail Amdule, you and colleague from STBB. Okay, I'm definitely sure. I also don't know what is it. Let's make it as if I don't know. Uh, sorry, we're just a property law firm. Property law firm. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Pearl. I'm from uh, Kayelicha community. Good evening. My name is Lubabalomos. I'm from. I'm also a Kayelicha activist. Thank you very much. Um, I was just buying us time for everybody to settle down. So it worked nicely. Everybody's in. I'm not going to waste any time. We, we are going to start with the public hearing on housing consumer protection, protection bill. The procedure is I'm going to hand over to the National Department of Human Settlement rep to uh, present. And I'm going to allocate not more than 20 minutes. And then after that, we'll do the questions um, about the bill as it gets to be explained by um, the rep from national department. Then after it will be the submissions. Importantly, questions, not the submissions, so that it can be easier for us to get the metrics of whether your contribution says you support the bill or you don't support the bill. So. And when we do the submission, please try to stick to three minutes. I can allow it to be to four minutes. Another option is we are going to put the um, information where you can do the written submission also. Uh, you can do the voice note on the WhatsApp, the number will be there, or also send the WhatsApp as your submission. Importantly, your name, say, name, contact details have to be on that submission. And the submissions are going to be open until the 9th of July, also for the housing consumer bill. So if there can be another submission, it's still open until the 9th of July. Then the closing of the submissions also for this bill will be on that day. On your desk, there is the translations. If there is during the submission or during the presentation, you want to listen in Afrikaans, you will have that. On these devices, Afrikaans is number four. Kosa in English is number six. So if a person stands up speak Kosa, a person that is there will speak in English, you will listen in English. If it's uh, English, then you can listen to Kosa on number six. The four is only Africans. And um, the, what is another one? After, when we do the submissions on the screen, you'll see that's where the number will be and the email will be for you to do the submission, the written submission or the WhatsApp or the, the voice note on the submissions. With that being said, I'm going to hand over to you may judge more to lead us with your presentation. Thank you. As already indicated, I'm from the National Department of Human Settlement. I'm here today because the minister has requested us to come and form part of the public hearing supporting the province. And the other reason why we are here is uh, as national is to ensure the progressive realization of section 26 of the constitution, which gives the housing consumer the right to have access to adequate housing.
So that is why we, as the department, have the NHBRC as an implementing agent to ensure that uh, the provisions of the Act as it is currently and, of course, the proposed amendments through the bill are implemented correctly. So I'm going to start with the presentation. I'm going to be short, as already advised by the chairperson. Um, I'm just going to give you a highlight of the amendments that we are proposing through the bill. I will try and make comparison in showing what is currently happening and uh, what the bill intends, you know, to, you know, what we intend to have through the amendments in the bill. So I will start now. As you know, once the bill has been approved, it's going to repeal the current act, which is the National Housing Consumer Protection Measures Act, Act number 95 of 1998. I will then go to chapter one of the bill, uh, which speaks about the definitions. Um, and uh, as part of the amendments, we're going to focus on the definition of a home, which seeks to expand, to, which is now expanded to include hostels, timeshares, the share block, but excludes a hotel, motel, a shack, and any dwelling unit without its own bathroom and kitchen. I know we have had a lot of questions on why are you excluding a house without its own bathroom and kitchen. And the simple response to the question is, the moment when the NHBRC comes in, um, it does not operate alone uh, through the legislation that we are presenting today. It also complies with other pieces of legislations that are already in place. So what happens is, if you are building a home, that your home must be approved in terms of the building plans, which must be approved by the municipality. So the municipality currently, when they approve those housing plans, they will be approving what we call a permanent structure, which is defined as a home in the Act. So the permanent structure does not include an informal settlement or an informal uh, you can, we can give an example of a shack. So if we now say, um, if we, we say a house can exclude a bathroom and a kitchen, it means we must accept any form of a structure that, that can also include an informal settlement, which is a shack. Hence, uh, the, the bill is, and the act is very clear, it's a permanent structure a home that is capable of protecting the, the people that are residing in the home from the outside environment. So that's what is considered an, a permanent um, structure. The bill also introduced a new definition, which is a definition of a build. The definition will now include repairs, renovations, alterations, and extensions, which necessitate the submissions of housing plans. So in other words, if the renovation that you will be embarking on does not require the approval of the building plans, then it can be excluded. In other words, you will not be required to comply with the provisions of the Act. But if it requires the building plans and the approval as such, you will have to comply with the requirements of the Act. The definition of a home builder. <clears throat> so the definition of a home builder as it stands currently, it uh, provides for owner-builder exemption. So with the introduction of the bill now, the amendments will now, they will no longer be uh, owner-builder exemptions, meaning that the owner-builder will also now be required to comply with the provisions of the Act to register, to be registered and also to enroll their home or the, the, the extensions that they will be doing on the existing home. The definition of um, the MEC. In the current act, the act makes reference to the MEC, but it does not define the MEC. So we are now going to define the MEC, also the HOD, the municipal manager, and the MMC. Uh, the definition of a day, currently, we don't have the definition of a day in the Act. We have it in the regulations. So what we are going to do now is to include the definition of a day in the, 
in the in the act in the bill in the act yes so the exemptions i think what is important with the exemption is to understand that the minister may exempt any person or a home from complying with the provisions of the act and for but that will only be done in uh, exceptional circumstances exceptional circumstances is anything out of the ordinary so meaning that if it's a special case the the the, the council the nhbrc will make an assessment of your application for exemption and if they find that is it indeed uh, a, 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 a an exceptional circumstances then they will present a, such application before the minister so there are two requirements for this um, it is that uh, the exemption must be in the interest of the public, and it must not um, contravene the objectives of the of the of the of the of the bill or the act. Composition of the board. Um, the bill specifies uh, knowledge, experience required in the composition of the board which was not there currently. So, in other words, for a person to be considered a member of the board they will have to be subjected to certain um, you know, uh, requirements. So if they do meet them, then they will be considered. And also it's important to note that um, uh, the private sector will also be considered. Uh, currently, the bill was, uh, was only considering people or from the national departments or entities of government. So now it's gonna, it's gonna open up to everyone basically. And also what is important is to mention that uh, persons with town planning and property development expertise have been added. So meaning that we will they will consider also expertise that are necessary to the building industry, which is also good. The name of the council. The name of the council, as you know, is the NHBRC, but currently um, it says National Home Building registration council. So now it's going to be National Home Building Regulatory Council. And the reason why it's regulatory is so that it's broad, because the council does not only look at the registration uh, of the home builders, it also looks at other factors like to regulate the, the construction or the building industry. So now it will have a bigger role to play, and hence they have opted for the name regulatory. Um, I think what is also important, uh, the appointment of the CEO and the CFO. Currently, it is the council that appoints the CEO, and the CEO then appoints the CFO. But that, uh, that power has now been taken away from the council, and it has been given to the board, meaning that the board will have the power to appoint the CEO and the CFO. The, the registration of the home builder. So what the bill is introducing now is the expansion of the home builder uh, uh, database. Currently what they have is a register for the home builders. So the bill now requires that they be an integrated database. Integrated database will have all the information that is required. For example, the information of the home builders that are registered with the council, the, the information about the work of the home builders, if, if there have been any non-compliances that were issued by the council on, on, the, on the home builders and whether those non-compliance um, um, were, uh, notices were satisfied, meaning that there were rectification that were suggested by the council and the home builder has complied with them. So you will be able to see as the, as the housing consumer kind of a track record on the home builder that you may opt for or that that are available within your area. So it gives you more information. You will have that access to information that will assist you to make a, a, a proper decision when, when choosing who must build for you. Um, then the registration of a developer and enrollment of a home. Currently, the Act does speak about the registration of the developer, but it is not clear on the responsibilities thereof and uh, regarding the enrollment. So now the, the bill makes it clear um, on, the, on the functions, 
because we have the home builder, we have the developer. Who is the home builder and who is the developer? What are their responsibilities? So if it's the developer engaging services of the home builder, the developer must be registered and the home builder also. And they must, uh, the developer must ensure that uh, the whatever build that has been done, it's also enrolled with the NHBRC. So it's clear. Then the funds of the council. Currently, the council runs through the through monies derived from the enrollment, from the registration fees, and also from the annual registration fees. That money is not enough. You know, considering the function of the council and the fact that they need to go out there and do inspections uh, across the country, it's, it's, it's a huge function, and they need more money for that. So that is why now, with the bill, what it's introducing is the appropriation of funds by parliament, meaning that parliament will give money now to the NHBRC and they will be accountable for that money and parliament will also be in a position to monitor whether the money given has been used for the purpose intended for. The warranty cover. So whenever we talk of the warranty cover, currently the warranty cover it kicks in from date of occupation. So what the bill is trying to introduce now it's for the warranty cover to start from the construction phase. So meaning that if the home builder is busy building and something goes wrong with the foundation, then the home builder will be ex expected to rectify that. And um, that means now we are providing more protection to you as the housing consumer because we are not going to wait until the build is completed. We will, NHBRC must do their inspection work, and then if they find anything wrong, they need to, that needs to be rectified immediately. So that's what we mean by the warranty cover commencing from construction. And also what is important here is to understand that the, the roof leak, um, uh, the roof leak warranty, uh, it's now extended from 12 months to two years, meaning that in the, in the first years, if for a period of two years, there's nothing wrong with your roof on the houses that are built by us or government, then uh, it means um, your, your, your cover will lapse. In other words, why have, are we extending to two years? Uh, we want to, through a period of time, to check that uh, through the rainy season, what happens? Because normally when it's raining, your roof will show whether there's any problems with your roof or not. So the two years now is enough, unlike a one year. You know, two years is going to be enough because other people will be saying, you know, we don't experience much rain, so therefore we are not in a position to see if indeed there are any issues with the roof. So that is why it has been extended to two years. And the other thing that has been introduced by the by the bill is it makes provision for home builders liability for cost of alternative accommodation. In other words, if it is found that they have built a home and a lot of things have gone wrong in that, home, in that home and it's no longer suitable for you to stay in, then um, the home builder can be ordered by the council first to provide an alternative accommodation for you whilst they are fixing the home or once they come with any other uh, alternative that will be necessary in order to address the wrongs that will have been done. Then the minimum and the maximum amount payable from the warranty fund. Uh, I think what is critical here is to understand that the minister retains the, retains the powers as per the act to determine the minimum and the maximum amount. So the amounts will not just change. It will be the minister who, who make those changes and she will do that through the, through, the, through the regulations. It will be prescribed. Then adjudication of contractual disputes between home builders and, home, and the housing consumers. As you know, when the home builder, when you engage the home builder, there will be uh, contracts that are concluded between the home builder and the home owner. Um, that is why we speak of professionalizing the council, professionalizing the industry to make sure that you know 
agreements that are concluded between the parties or the two parties, they are formal. So in other words, they must be written and they must be signed by all the parties. So the council is the one currently that uh, tries to resolve those disputes between the parties, should there be any. And then um, what uh, the, pro the, the, the bill is trying to introduce is the it's for the referral of the disputes to adjudication in terms of procedures prescribed by the ministers and also provides for 45 day time frame for those uh, disputes to be finalized the cases that are in disputes they are handled through the disciplinary committee but now what is proposed is the establishment of the compliance and enforcement committee which committee will run for a period of four years and why four years because the disciplinary committee was running with the you know it was linked to the period of the council the reason why it's four years is so that we eliminate corruption we don't want uh, the the committee to see to be permanent because then with the challenge of corruption that we have in the country we don't want them to feel comfortable and start you know uh, creating relations that are not uh, permitted in terms of the act. It's just a way of trying to to deal with complaints that uh, we receive from people as the national department. And also the bill will also speak on the duties of the inspectors relating to anti-corruption, conflict of interest, uh, using confidential information by inspectors for personal benefits extended to and this also is extended to the Compliance Enforcement Committee. So, which means that anyone who plays a role in the functions in, as per the Act, there will be actions taken against them in terms of the Act. When it comes to the enforcement, um, currently the Act allows the Disciplinary Committee to issue penalties and fines for any contraventions that will be found. Uh, and the fines that are given are fines not exceeding 25,000 currently. The, 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 the disciplinary committee can also issue warnings and withdrawals of registration. So with the current uh, proposals through the bill, uh, the, the committee can, can fine or issue penalties as follows. 10% of the project value, which means that there will be that assessment that will be done, and also 100% of the remedial cost ex expended, a maximum fine of 1 million, a maximum fine of 1 million. It does not mean that it will always be 1 million. It will depend on the, on the case, what's happening, and uh, it could be lesser than that. It could be way lesser than that. It can also be 25,000, uh, which is the current uh, fine. Uh, now, and then the above, the the other thing that can be imposed is a suspension or cancellation of the registration, um, and may also impose any alternative or other appropriate relief in line with the objective of the act. And then on the clarification of inspectors' role. Um, Section 70, 71, and 72 of the bill does, you know, indicate um, or the clarification on the inspector's role. I will not go into detail on, on that because of the time, but you, you can also read it yourself. Then I will also touch on the, the, the suspended non-compliance in terms of section, two, section 62 of the bill. Any person may report uh, suspected non-compliance by any person to the uh, even if you are not the, the 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 housing consumer if you see or suspect any non-compliance by a home builder or developer you can approach the council and report so that the council can also go and do their own inspection and their investigation the, uh, what the bill is introducing now is the council may apply to court for an order directing the person to comply with the act or to stop the construction. Uh, lastly, uh, the duties of financial institutions, conveyancers, and MEC respectively. So what the bill is doing is to extend it to 
uh, HODs, municipal managers, and the MMC, meaning that they will also have the responsibility to ensure that the, the home builder or the developers that they engage, that they are registered and enrolled with the council. The duty on the registrar of deeds, yeah, I think this is what is important, what the bill is doing now, is to take away the duty on the register of deeds um, as the deeds is concerned with the registration of property and not necessarily a home. Uh, I think I will end it there. This is just a brief on on what the bill is trying to introduce as compared to the current position of the Act. Thank you, Chairperson. Thank you very much. That is the story of the Housing Consumer Protection Bill. I'm going to open up for the questions from the floor or clarity, if there might be some. I don't see any hand that is being raised, and I'm going to ask a question, just one question. I just want to find out you talked about the, the NHBRC now having to receive the money from Parliament. And when you say Parliament, I mean, you mean you are going to allocate from the budget of human settlements or it's coming direct um, from Parliament and it's going to, before now where, where they generating their own revenue without receiving the money? Because I, I still remember the other time they had a lot of surplus. Now, if the government now has to give them the money, what's the reason behind that? What's the rationale behind that if they were having surplus almost every year and you still have to allocate the money to them? And um, I think that will be the only thing. And then the cost attached to this bill, how much is it? Did you do the budgeting for this bill to be there? That's all from me. I don't see any questions. Oh, okay. There's the two hands. And the third one. You can. Thank you, Chair. Um, thank you for the presentation. Um, I think I have a submission pertaining to um, Section 25. Or question, or question, I think, clarity and also a submission. OK, um, we'll do that one. Um, name and say name first. OK, um, Tumaki Yosa. Uh, development action group who themselves be registered with the council now and then also enroll the development even though they're going to appoint a home builder who's accredited with um by an hbrc a, a registered home builder now the question is how do we expect an old person for example who benefited from a housing subsidy who wants to generate um income additional income through those rental flats one um, has not factored in the cost of um, NHPRC, which is amounted, I think, an estimated 6,500 per unit. So that person who's developing four units needs to cough up that amount. Secondly, um, how do we expect that person to pay for that? And also, how do we expect a person who's not technically inclined to be registered by by the council as a developer or the property owner who wants to develop those smaller units, micro units at the back of their property? I think that is the question from my side. Uh, just a couple of questions. Um, so to start off with, I just wanted to ask a question on the exemptions. Um, the wording is kind of, is very strong in that it's only exceptional circumstances, right? Uh, I just want to hear from your side what is considered to be exceptional circumstances. Um, is this a, a power that can be later on delegated to the various offices to determine what's exceptional circumstances? Um, also, a question on the affordable housing. Is an exceptional circumstance a category of value of homes that can be excluded from the enrollment fee um, with the NHPRC? Not necessarily not enrolling, because obviously we want those structures and homes to be covered. But, um, for example, 350000 and below, is that an exceptional circumstance of categories of homes that can be excluded? Second, um, to add on to the exceptional circumstances, I know that municipalities, particularly here in the Western Cape, um, after the inclusionary housing policy came out uh, last year, there will be a move towards um, inclusionary housing um, included into developments within the greater um, Western Cape. Would 
and exceptional circumstance B, that the minister can, in tandem with that policy, sort of um, allow that 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 um, IOH units within those developments also be encompassed under a sort of exclusion on the enrollment fee. Okay, so that's just on the exclusion basis um, in exceptional circumstances. Then another question regarding the ex expansions into renovations, right? How is this going to be measured and policed? So if I'm doing a renovations of extending, how do I um, enroll just my extension? How do I enroll any of that and to what value? Am I enrolling my full value of the property or just my extension? How is that going to be monitored and policed? Because that's going to be a problem. Secondly, the section says that when you have to submit a plan to council, so and a big part here currently in, in, in City of Cape Town at least, when you are doing something on your property and you have to submit to council and council picks up that you have a historical um, extension or innovation on your property that hasn't been previously, even by you or the previous owner, you then now, before you can do whatever new thing on the property, you have to submit a building plan in respect of that previous extension. So now I'm having to submit a building plan for something that a previous owner has done. Now I have to also enroll that and enroll a fee and also pay levies for the next few years as well. So how is that going to be catered and dealt with as well? Um, yeah, so just want to see if there's anything else. Ah, um, the renovations also, a lot of people in the middle income sector, they use, they leverage financings from their bonds in order to, to build um, the extensions and stuff. Now you're prohibiting the banks from financing anything unless you're enrolled. So is this sort of a thing where all homeowners must now first get their thing enrolled before they can approach a bank to see if they can get financing uh, to do their innovations. And I think that's it for now. Thank you very much. Over to you, sir. Yeah, just the concern, I think um, you raised the issue about um, the funding. So also in terms of um, staffing, the efficiency of it, um, once the it's in the act acted, um, so this is also a concern with regard to your implementation there of, um, because you see many state um, entities failing um, in delivering in that. So we want to see what um, measures are, are, you, are you putting in place to be able to ensure that service delivery um, takes place. Thank you very much, ma'am. Um, just a question that came to my mind now. During the COVID period, did Communique receive a, um, like a COVID relief um, for loss of income, rental income? Because I have applied for um, a COVID relief fund like um, during that time for loss of um, income just to relieve myself um, from the burden. And um, I just want to know um, that did they receive, yeah? Difficult for me to answer that one. I don't know if there's, there's anyone that <clears throat> knows in here. We'll find the information from you. Thank you. Okay. Over to you, sir. I think that you said there's someone who raised their hand. That's it. Okay. That's you, sir. Oh, sorry. So, hi, my name is Sherwin uh, Prim. I am actually just a homeowner, so this is purely out of interest as well. Um, I think I've got a couple of questions, uh, particularly with regard to um, obviously um, enrollment as well. So the question is at the moment, um, what's, what's being proposed is obviously an extension to involve contractors that are going to be taking on renovations, alterations, additions and extensions. Does that mean that there will still be a blend of uh, private insurance as well as uh, the fund that's that's coming uh, through from the NHBRC? Um, so I think that's one part that just needs a little bit more clarification is will it be sort of a, a mixed insurance fund and, and mixed uh, sort of blend? Um, and and what to what extent uh, that that kind of will be involved um, with, with private insurers as, as well as uh, this fund as well? Um, the other comment that I've actually just got is that this, there also seems to be quite to solidify a lot of the constitutional imperatives as well. So I think where it comes to issues with regard to uh, access to information, so that being uh, addressing the issue which was mentioned with regard to 
grading of boulders, uh, non-compliance of boulders, uh, because of, in current circumstance, uh, that's actually with the NHBRC, it's paper-based. None of it is actually electronic. So you can lodge a um, an inquiry. Um, none of that information is going to be accessible unless the person behind that desk is motivated enough to actually go and look for those paper records um, to get all of that. Um, second thing is just with regard to equality, um, I think that this current bill actually answers that as well, mainly because I think by including renovations, extensions and, and additions, um, you're not excluding an, uh, other housing consumers from, um, you know, from protections that are offered in, in the current housing bill as well, um, or the, the current act as well. So I think it actually answers that that question. One thing I've noticed with regard to the powers of the NHBRC is um, it's actually just with regard to um, disciplinary action and uh, investigation as well of non-compliant building. There seems to be rather, I would say, a misinterpretation of the powers of the NHBRC. So I think how the current act is actually interpreted is that um, it's perceived that um, the NHBRC cannot take action against uh, home builders that are registered, that are carrying out renovations, alterations, and additions. The current act actually does stipulate if within it that the NHBRC is empowered by the act to actually take disciplinary action where builders are non-compliant, um, and there is actually proof of that as well. Um, and to regulate the industry in terms of standards as well, which I think that actually needs to be addressed. Um, and I think the current bill that's proposed actually includes that. So I think um, it is quite inclusive just from, from my comment as well. That's just one of those comments. But I think what needs to be addressed is probably the involvement of private insurers um, and the centralization or what it appears as, as the centralization of sort of an insurance fund for, for these contractors as well. Just as a comment, um, I, I do note that there were concerns about um, obviously renovations um, that were being taken on, but I think that has been clarified and it has actually specified that this is only applying to renovations, home alterations, additions that would require a, a building plan submission. So I think whatever doesn't require that, um, just needs better clarification, and I think it needs to be clearly defined. Um, with regard to language, um, I think as a homeowner, <laughs> I can definitely tell you that trying to interpret the, to interpret the act um, and understand it very clearly um, had to, has taken me some time. I think that in terms of language, we need to try and avoid um, legalizing the language or um, making or including too much legal jargon in there um, and make it simple enough for the common builder, the common household owner to actually understand. Um, and I think just in terms of access um, and understanding the act, I think that that probably answers a lot of the question to that. Thank you very much. I, I left that you must ask all the questions so that it's just one round of the questions, so don't see any other hands. So that will be the end of questions. So over to you. Thank you. Um, I will start with the question raised by the chairperson on the appropriation of funds by parliament. It's going to be the parliament um, giving money to the council for for, in order for them to carry out their function. At this stage, uh, I cannot confirm whether the funds will go directly to the National Department of Human Settlement or they will go to, to the council directly. But, uh, you know, taking into consideration that the council reports to the minister through the board, so the money may be allocated to, to the national department, but I cannot confirm that at this stage. What we know is that there will be money coming from the parliament, which will then respond 
to also questions that have been raised about the the capacity of the council, whether they have enough staffing to carry out their function, um, uh, and also the fact that you said NHBX is making money. So, so you know, how, how are we balancing that? Are they being given money because they don't have the money? Or, you, you know, those, those are the, 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 the questions that... Um, that will be responded to also by, I'm happy that the NHBRC is currently already working on the implementation plan in order to address the, the, the new proposals through the bill and also the current act, because we know uh, the capacity is a challenge. We need more inspectors out there. We need more investigators out there. I'm good at this. Sorry, say, before you move out, you listen to the bill. Um, were you in support or not support of this bill? Well, lady, I've never been through the bill. Pardon? I've never been through the bill. Oh, you have never been through no, the lady. bill? No, lady. And as, as one of the gentlemen mentioned, there's some parts that's in the, above my vocabulary. No, Tetsi. My... IQ is not that high. If they can lay it out a little bit more simple, okay. I will believe I will be enjoyable. Okay. We will and try to do that. May God, may God bless and you. Thank you for your time. We'll try to put that in the in the negotiating mandate to tell to tell them that now we that English is too much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Um yeah, I hope I I've responded to that question. So more clarity will come. Um, I, we hope that by the time the bill goes back to the NCOP, um, the meetings with the NHBRC, between the NHBRC and the department will have been finalized also, so that we can speak to you know, some of the questions that are being raised. That still needs clarity on how the implementation part is going to be out. So um, the owner builder, the question on the owner builder, how do we expect people like pensioners to be able to comply with the act by registering or enrolling the, the build or part of the work which may fall under renovations? Um, I think it's, it's important that we always remember that you know, like we 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 already talking about exceptional circumstances. The question on uh, ex exceptional circumstances, if we are to respond to it properly, it will obviously, you know, um, then uh, provide categories categories uh, of uh, homes and uh, homeowners. Uh, that can be excluded or that can be, uh, you know, that may not be expected to comply with certain provisions of the Act. But before we do that, it's very difficult to respond to that question because, you know, I may say something and tomorrow it does not fall within those categories and you're like, oh, but this is not what we... But I think what is critical, it's it's the how do we then define exceptional circumstances? I mean, exceptional circumstances by its nature, once you define it, once you define it, then you may no longer be expected to come and say this is an exceptional circumstances. So meaning that once we provide a definition of exceptional circumstances, we put one, two, three, up to 10, anything from 11, may no longer fall within the exceptional circumstances. I know I'm being technical, but what we're saying is we're not going to run away from explaining exceptional circumstances. We're going to do that through the regulations. And, um, but again, um, it, will, it, it will differ from, cases are different. So once you define, you may, you may no longer have to deal with any other uh, applications you know, seeking except, exemptions if those exemptions are not uh, are not are not already defined. 
in the in the regulations. So, but um, obviously the department will look at. Um, I mean, already as we speak, the um, minister has prioritized certain groups of people. Uh, the elderly people, the disabled people, and uh, orphans. So if you are going to look at uh, people who may not be expected to, to comply with the act, you are tempted to say, okay, maybe those categories of people may not be subjected to the provisions of the act. But again, we need to, to create a balance because you may look at the homeowner now, but what we are protecting is the home, so that whoever stays in that home, it's protected even in the future. It, they hold it like that. But yes, there's a number of considerations that are going to be made. And uh, of course, with the engagement with the people, it will be easy to make sure that we include everyone who is supposed to be included. Um, I think I've responded enough on the exceptional circumstances. The expansion and renovations, how do we enroll them? Um, the, the, the council provides, you know, it, it provides on, on the issues of, already we said, anything that requires the approval of the building plan will have to be enrolled. So that part of the work must be covered will have to be enrolled. So if it does not, already it, it means you will not be required to comply with the, with the provision. So, but if it requires that, then it, the work will have to be enrolled so that you can be covered. We can provide a cover to the, home, to the, to the housing consumer. Um, the previous home, how do we deal with that? If you find yourself in a situation where the, the previous home was not did not comply with the requirements of the act, was not enrolled and all. Remember, the enrollment again, it's, it, it covers for a period of five years. So if you come after five, if you buy a property and that five year period has already lapsed, you cannot be expected to enroll that home. It's already existing. So the, the application of the bill or the act, it applies to, the, and a, to a new build, a new home and the renovations. So a home that is already existing and was not covered, obviously it will not, it will not apply to that home. So if you want to do anything on that home, if municipality feels that you, you need to comply with certain requirements, you will have to go through that process, but that will not require that, you know, they come and say, no, this was not done correctly, you know. I think it will only be an issue of paperwork that needs to go with the entire process, but not to say do one, two, three on the existing structure. It will not go to that extent. The issue of funding. How are you going to monitor the funding that is going to be provided to the NHBRC? I always say, when it comes to accountability, all entities of government, they must account in terms of the PFMA. Whether the money is less or more, you are still accountable. You must account the same, same way. Yes, there's more money that is going to be issued. That is why it is not only the responsibility of the NHBRC, it is also the responsibility of the National Department of Human Settlement to ensure that uh, the NHBRC implements the provisions of the act as expected. And the minister always has the right to take actions against the council and the board members because, you know, they, they report to her. And that is why now minister is also establishing committees herself so that, you know, they, there is that independency from the council. It's not only the council that runs the show, but there is also those committees that will you know, to, to introduce fairness and um, take away biasness from the from the committee. So the issue of insurance, uh, the the involvement of the private insurance on the work of the council. Um, the council will only provide a warranty cover, but that doesn't stop the 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 home. We as much as we're trying to regulate the home building industry. The home building industry existed before the NHBRC, and they were subjected to certain provisions of 
of, of law, Le different legislation that they, 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 they are expected to comply with. So already the, the home builders and the developer would have their own private insurance uh, to protect themselves also. So they also are registered with other bodies uh, the in the construction industry, you know. So this is just an addition. And the reason why we introduced it is also that it covers the low market people that cannot afford because this also covers the ho homes that are built by us. So it doesn't take away any other um, uh, alternatives that are available out there. Um, I will request the NHBRC to also assist me with some of the questions that might have been raised that I did not respond to. Um, thank you. Okay, over to you, ma'am. Thank you, Chairperson. Um, Chairperson, before I, I start addressing some of the questions, I just want to 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 highlight um, what what the purpose of this bill actually is: is to provide protection to housing consumers or to ensure that we extend that mandate to housing consumers because at the end of the day we, we are fully aware of home builders that does not comply with um, the act as it currently stands and at the end of the day it's the housing consumers that are suffering as a result of that so the whole purpose of this act is to ensure that housing consumers are protected by through this regulation then I want to, to go into the first question, Chairperson, that related to funds. So currently the funds of the NHBRC comes from your enrollment fees, your registration fees, and then your annual renewal fees. Those fees are very minimal, uh, Chairperson, and they have not um, increased since this legislation came into effect in 1998. So the maximum enrollment fee that you pay is about 34,000 rand. Um, your registration fees is uh, 600 or 500 and but in total it's 1.2 chairperson and then annually you pay 576 rand um, for your renewal fees so um, given that our mandate has now been extended to include your additions and alterations your innovations um, there may be a need chairperson um, yes it's provided for in the in the legislation but as we go along, and, and given that our mandate has been extended, there may be an issue of capacity. And for those reasons, you know, we would then require responsibility. Because at the end of the day, they are the one that received the money from the bank, from the housing consumer. Now you find another home builder that does not have the funds to rectify because a, a developer has run away and fails to, you know, remedy the defects at the end of the day. I also want to say that not everybody is a home builder. I cannot build a house. And, and therefore, I don't have the necessary expertise to do that. So when I want to extend my house or when I want to then build a house, then I need to appoint a registered home builder to do that as I'm unable to do the construction myself. Um, but also, given uh, on the issue of the owner builder, um, I'll, I'll allow for, for those other questions. On the issue of owner builder, um, one must be mindful that, um, like my colleague has indicated, I may know of home building, but at the end of the day, once that property in year two or year three, for some other reason, you need to sell that property. Now you find a housing consumer um, and you sell to, a, uh, you know, there are two or three housing consumers, and they, they also need protection. Um, because if that house has severe defects at the end of the day, they are the, um, it's the housing consumer that are going to be prejudiced by that. In relation to the issue of exceptional uh, circumstances, there will still be um, regulations drafted. I don't think it's appropriate to say what those exceptional circumstances would be because it would be on a case-by-case -case basis. The rules, however, do make provision to say that um, in relation to the question that you had, is whether there would be, um, whether certain homes would be exempted from paying certain fees, um, the bill provides in section 39 that um, the council may differentiate between different categories of fees in relation to different categories of homes, different categories of home builders and developers based on a grading status. Therefore, you know, there is um, options available in terms of what those fees would be, but to specify and say these are the exceptional circumstances would be premature as it would be on a case-to-case -case basis. Um, on the issue of additions and alterations, 
Um, the gentleman has correctly indicated to say that not all additions and alterations would require enrollment. It would only be if it um, requires municipal plans. When it, in my view, and, and I'm no expert, when it requires municipal plans, it's generally that the renovations are extensive in nature. Now, now you, the reason why this was included is that you find that homeowners spend a considerate amount of money. Um, to do those renovations or take out bonds for that um, effect. So at the end of the day, those housing consumers also need to be protected um, because they are the ones, you know, that are most vulnerable in those circumstances. Um, on the issue of, uh, I, I did, you, you said a lot of things, so apologies, I didn't get to all of it. Um, on the issue of the private insurance in terms of the warranty, these are deemed warranties that are provided for in the um, legislation as it is. Um, but uh, however, my view is that is not prevent. I am not sure what I missed, Chairperson. Um, if I did miss anything, then we will get back to. You only missed your bank balance. I'm joking. <laughs> um, I think. <laughs> um, I think that you responded to every question. Um, any clarity or follow up of the question? Ooh, what did you do? Okay. Over to you, sir. Okay, thank you, Chair. Um, I think I wanted to clarify this. Um, we're on the same page in terms of enforcement and enro enrollment of, 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 of new builds and extensions and alterations. The question that I wanted to ask, I, as a property owner, now, property has been the house that I'm residing in, has been enrolled formally, everything is fine. I do have space in my property now, that I want to develop backyard rooms, formal structures. Now, the current regulation says, or oh, when I go, or the property owner, when they want to enroll, when they go there and give a point, a con I appoint a contractor who's the NHBRC registered. Now, but now when it has to go to enrollment stage, the requirement is for the property owner to go and register the development under the property owner's name now, nah, even though they're gonna be holding this stock, we're not against enrollment of that. I think it's the clarification in that instant that provides or that should provide for a, a, a homeowner to appoint, whether they're developing in their own property, to appoint an HBRC contractor. The contractor will be the one, the home builder, will be the one who enrolls the development under their company name because they have the technical skills. But currently, it requires the property owner who has no technical skills to go and register with NHPRC themselves, firstly. That person does not have the capacity of having a team of professionals within a company or register a company. I think that's where this part comes in, or I just wanted to clarify that. Person, would you allow me to respond? Okay. Uh, I just want to clarify. Um, first of all, uh, currently, when uh, when you when you're building a secondary dwelling on your home, in terms of the current legislation, you you that property has to be enrolled with NHVRC. It's in our current legislation. The legislation currently also provides that when you venture into the sphere of a business of a home builder, which results in you selling off those homes or leasing out that property, you have to be registered. So it's not something entirely new that has now been incorporated into this legislation. It's the law as it stands. So as soon as you start venturing into what, you, then you're no longer a housing consumer. Uh, you're now into the business of what a home builder is. And with any other situation where the law says X, Y, and Z, if you venture into those spheres, you have to comply with the law. Thank you, Chairperson. Um, on that last point, um, but it, I think what he's trying to clarify is as much as they're venturing into what is a home builder, the problem is, is your, your contractor not knowing that there's now automatic duties and responsibilities enforced in them in terms of the act. So their first time, let's be honest, their first time of hearing this compliance is, is if they receive a notice from the NHPRC, hey, you are not enrolled, you need to get enrolled. And then they have a specific amount of time to get enrolled. That person has to somehow figure out what they need to learn and write that piece of thing to get enrolled. And then they only have to do it for that one time in their life and pay 
fees and levies for the next five years, but it was just for that one at one instance where they've paid a contractor to build in their property because they wanted to increase the value in their assets. And that is the 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 the, the scope of people that my colleague is, is concerned about, of that you are forcing someone to learn and write an exam and be a registered contractor when that's not what they intended to do. They're just trying to increase their asset value. Okay, so it's sort of that catch that they want sort of to be dealt with. Um, <clears throat> but then on, if I can get back to the earlier points on um, the funding. So my understanding is that it was mentioned earlier that there is a understanding that the NHPRC did have a surplus in funding somewhere. Um, so I just want to get a fully understanding that you are saying you're increasing scope of work. Yes. OK. And then you also are saying that the levies that you issue from the warranty is minimal and you are saying up maximum of what, 35, 34,000 per home. But there is a, what, a couple hundred thousand million homes built and registered annually. What funds are you sitting with at this point? Um, if I may ask that that you're saying that you don't have enough funds to cover your operational costs. What is the difference between those two? Is uh, your operational cost currently 400 million and then you are bringing on the warranty fund only 300 million that you need to extend? And then my question earlier on the renovations I asked about, how is the value going to be calculated? Because currently you typically have to provide your sale agreement from your developer for the new builds to have a value attached to your enrollment fee. How is your alterations going to going to attach to um, renovations going to have a fee? Is it going to be a contractual relationship between you and 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 your con and your contractor? Or now what happens then in the case of where I am a self contract and I build myself? I have no contract with myself to indicate what value that is. Uh, how is that going to be determined um, on that value side? And as and I understand also the purpose of 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 protecting the lower market here, but there is, there must be an understanding to the point that as you increase the market of where people need to pay more fees and more people need to add more fees, the contractors and developers, they will also increase their fees of home building. And that will have a knock on effect on actual values of homes and properties. And as much as you want to extend um, that reach and cover, there also needs to be understanding that you are going to now start eliminating people from being able to afford a home. There is that drop off where someone's now outside of the region. Um, the, the, the person that now has caused their home to be built, she has to now pay an additional money that she didn't understand needed to be done for enrolling with the NHPRC. That, so it's all of these sort of minor things that are of a concern. And as much as you don't want to speak about the exceptional circumstances now, it is the exceptional circumstances that I'm concerned about. And as much as you want to say you don't want to codify it in in, in specific wordings, there are certain examples that you can codify and say further, it's not a closed list. And so when do we get to the, to the point of discussing those exceptional circumstances? Do you issue the regulations or do we start discussing it in the lead up to those regulations? Ooh, thank you very much. Okay, I will respond to the last one. When do we start the discussion? Um, we'll start the discussion when we we do public hearings on the regulations. Um, it's a process that it's going to include you uh, because already you are raising issues that are going to go into the regulations. So that gives us something to sit around the table and say, okay, these are the inputs that we got from the people and what do we do with this? The issue of um, many, many fees that we require from from home builders, it has been raised. And it has also been raised by the home building industry or bodies that represents the home builders. So they, they are not happy about the fees. They're saying it's a lot of them. Of course, when you are looking at it, there's a once-off registration, then there's an annual renewal fee. Then there's an enrollment as and when you embark on a new build or renovations that requires the, the, the home building plans. So, yeah, you, you are not the only one. Everyone is, not everyone, but yes, they've been raised a lot. So we have had you 
And um, I believe it's one issue that will have to be engaged on, not only by us, by, all, by the NCOP, by all the, the houses in parliament, because they have had those questions and they will have to provide clarity. Remember, as much as we are the council or the national, we, it's not our way. We are guided. We have already be, been given some of the amendments. Actually, they were imposed on us and they said, no, nope, you cannot go ahead with this. We, you are not going to, to have an NPO. We wanted an NPO because we felt, you know, at some stage, maybe we might want to do one, two, three. They said, no, 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 you're not ready for that. Not at this stage. So we were stopped and we stopped. Um, so we do listen. We do listen, and um, I'm not saying what's going to happen, but this is an issue that is coming and coming and coming, and a resolution will have to be taken on that. So it's not only us, uh, it's going to be the entire process taking uh, to come out. Please have a look and see uh, of those, the different funds that we have, but obviously we can't take the water, uh, from the warranty fund to fund operations. Um, we, we, your operations is funded and, and then you know you have your warranty fund. So we, we can't borrow from the one to fund the other one. But we, our annual report is there, it's coming out. Um, it would show, you know, what are the different fees, what um, is provided for when, um, and then you can have th that those are public um, information, if that would assist. Um, I can also take your details and share it when, when the latest report is available. On the issue of, um, you said a lot of things, um, on the issue of... Um, your balance in the bank. <laughs> <laughs> on the issue of, of many of, of the things that you were raising will require regulations. Those regulations will be drafted, it will be made public, it will be gazetted, and you'll comment on those. So on the issues of um, what you raised to say, we can't give you a list in, in what of those um, exceptional circumstances will be. Obviously, we don't want to go put out the list, which is contrary to, to what this Act aims to achieve. But when um, that list or is out or, or those regulations are published, um, then you will have an opportunity, you know, to comment on, on those regulations and make your inputs. Um, what did I miss? Discussion outside of this, because I see there needs to be engagement. But on, on the issue of the needs, there will be a lot of awareness um, for housing consumers as well as home builders to say, you know, these are your obligations, this is what you have to do. Housing consumers to be made aware of, say, these are the various protection mechanisms that you have in, that is provided for in this legislation. Please ensure that when your house is handed over, you, you know, notify the builder within the specific periods of these categories of defects that you have. Um, there is a chapter in this bill that relates to, for example, protecting the developer or housing home builder saying that if you have delivered work and the housing consumer refuses you to pay, you know, these are the different options that you have. So those type of trainings will still be done. Consumer awareness, because that's very important, you know, so that people understand and are aware these are my rights and these are my obligations. Thank you, Chairperson. Uh, thank you. I'm trying to, um, to, to close my eyes that I don't see any hand that has been raised for clarity. So I'm going to pretend like I'm not seeing any hand because we have to do the submission. So I can't even apologize because I didn't see anyone raising a hand. And we have to do the submissions. But I think with the questions that have been raised, truthfully so is, communications from NHBRC you need more communication because if your stakeholders are still asking the questions that they've been asking, that means there is more communication from NHBRC that has to happen for clarity of some of the, 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 the services or whatever, the payments or any other thing that needs clarity. And I think we also members of a calling an HBRC, that's the luxury that we have, that we can call them so that they can unpack um, the then and now with this bill. And then the, what is it that is fixing? And how are they going to make sure that that communication gets to reach that plumber that doesn't have the certificate, but is good in what they are doing within our communities? Because one way or another, it, it has to 
to to to assist those because so I see we use the our brothers that knows how to do the plumbing doesn't mean if they don't have the certificates they can't do a brilliant job they're good so we need to hold someone accountable in assisting them to have those certificates and I've been talking to an HBRC and say that we do have um, the the skilled people that cannot write exam like they being told they must write exam. But if you do oral examination, they will pass it because they know about that. But sitting down behind the desk is one thing that they won't get it. So those options, you need to be innovative as an HBRC, not to be policing per se, but also to add value into our communities. But communication, communication, communication is what we will be asking you, that how do you make sure that people, they get information? How do they access that information? And what that is expensive. So make it easy for them to make sure that they get that information that they can distribute. So I'm opening up for the submission. Okay. Thanks for seeing me. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, we, uh, as a department, are making three submissions, additional submissions to the ones we've made. Okay. I've already handed over um, our presentation. It's basically, I mean, the first comment we have is around, I think it's been debated a lot. So the Act itself on Clause 2.2a, for example, says it does not apply to a dwelling unit that does not have its own bathroom or kitchen. And I think it also ties in with one of the questions that have been asked to some extent around, you know, people who want to build in the backyard, are they also allowed or are they compelled to enlist or not? Um, so I think what we're trying to say as a department is that probably a definition of a dwelling unit needs to be given in the uh, act or in the bill. It's not there at the moment in the bill. I think it will also try to clarify some of the confusion because that context can also be extended to rural areas um, or backyarding situations. So we are suggesting that the bill at the moment considers a, uh, including a dwelling unit definition. We note that some municipalities do have definitions, but we don't want to tie it to a specific municipality. You can see what which one you want to use. Then secondly, around the, again, on the definitions, I think it's in page six of my document, is around uh, the definition of the home. Uh, in parts E to G, we just want you to just check if those exemptions also are included in the ones around 2.2a. Uh, if you can just check that, because it reads like it should be uh, included in that. The second comment we have as a department is around the geographic application of the bill. So it is silent on the moment on whether the bill is intended to assure um, building quality for homes in traditional authority areas or rural areas. So we just want you to uh, clarify that. We understand that the NHBRC um, is an institution that applies or works in the country entirely, but it's silent on the issue of rural areas. The key concern with rural areas is that, I mean, the bill does say that it's applicable to, in, to, to areas where or in, 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 in the construction in areas where people are meant to comply with national building regulations and municipal land use management um, regulations. My, or our suspicion is that probably in the rural areas when people build, they build anyway without probably taking into account, account those, but some clarity is required. If then the bill does extend to those areas, a key consideration um, that needs to be uh, thought of by the NHBRC is how they will reach those areas for inspection um, through your building um, inspectors, I think that's what you call them. Then lastly, Chair, it's around, we've noted the point that the ministers, according to the current act, is exempt, can exempt someone from complying with provisions of the act, and that's been debated quite a lot. But we do think that also the process of trying to get that exemption might be cumbersome for some households or some builders. Perhaps, um, uh, I think this one narrows down to human settlements in particular, perhaps some kind of uh, uh, sort of consideration should be uh, made on whether um, households, especially those who are going to receive service sites, are also compelled to comply with this bill because human settlements as a whole, I mean, Judge Moore would know this, 
is meant to be rolling out service, service sites uh, in numbers than top structures. And the expectation is that then households will build incrementally on their service sites. Mm -hmm. So if then you compel those households to comply with the bill, the fear we have or the concern we have is that it might you might be imposing uh, onerous barriers to building by those households. And I mean, someone else has also spoken to the costs that they that that may entail. Um, yeah, I think we'll end there. Those are the three comments we have, additional comments we have as a department. Thank you. And then we need that paper. Okay, we already emailed. Okay, thank you very much. Another submission? Okay, we'll we'll get it in return for. Okay, um, that's an escape clause, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you very much in advance for for the submission. Ladies and gentlemen, I think that's a wrap with the second bill. And if I have to say to the department, the provincial and the national NHBRC, thank you, thank you, thank you very much for being, it was a long road, by the way. You crisscrossed from Trichet and Jubek, Western Cape. By now you know Western Cape, you can be a tour guide for Western Cape. Others, the cars got broken on the road, I'm telling you. Others, they got lost, but eventually we are here. That's the last date. Now it will be the issue of the metrics and the negotiating mandates. So I want to thank you and also those public members that are here with us. Um, thank you, thank you very much. And another last one, Judge Moore, for me, it will be um, titled this of the service stands. Can you fast track that? We'll appreciate that so that people can start to build for themselves. And members, thank, oh, thank you for thanking me. Thank you very much for your, your, your hard work. That is very much appreciated. It's been a few weeks that you had to work until nine o'clock almost as we do the public hearings, sometimes even in load shedding. And our support staff, Lizette Shumis, thank you. This was our last public hearing on the Housing Consumer Bill and the expropriation.